Hey folks, I see you're coming in and uh, we're going to get started in a minute or two. Welcome all. Uh, this is going to be, uh, it's going to be fun, I think. It's going to be fun for me. Hopefully it'll be fun for you guys. Um, uh, but uh, this stuff is, if you've ever heard me talk about this kind of stuff, you could, you know that I, I get excited when I uh, see opportunity. Well, this stuff is, uh, it, it blows my mind and I think it's going to be something that you're all going to want to see as well. So I think we are all in. Uh, We're missing two right now. Um, so I'm just sending them a quick email, but you can probably get started. Um. Okay. Well, the first, and, and uh, let me just say to everybody that's, that's on the call that uh, this is obviously still a work in progress. This is the very first one of these that I've done or that we've done. And uh, so you guys are, are my guinea pigs. And in exchange for your guinea piggedness, if you will, um, uh, you will um, obviously you will get a copy of the video, but I'll be, and I'll, I'll be soliciting your feedback um, to help me figure out how to make this thing better. Um, and I'll make absolutely sure that you all get it. Uh, and if you don't get it, in this session or the second session, uh, we'll talk and make sure that you, you get it because it's important to me that you understand this stuff. And hopefully those of you who know me know that, um, that I have an ulterior motive, but I'm very transparent about it, is that I want you to do deals so that we can do deals together. Uh, your success and my success, in my opinion, are tied directly. So um, I do want you to understand what, what I'm talking about here. Uh, you probably figured out that I talk kind of fast. I am a New Yorker. Um, I'm going to try my best to modulate my speed. If I do start to get um, a little bit too fast, uh, let me know. I'm going to propose that we leave, if we can, leave the, um, the mute off so that you can jump in. But I would urge you, uh, there will be plenty of time. I'm going to try to make sure there's plenty of time for, for questions. If there's something that's really, really relevant that you got to get out there, uh, let me ask it and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you whether or not I want to answer it now or, or push it back to later. But uh, there's a lot of material to get through. Um, and I'm going to try my best to keep it in under two and a half hours. I'll, I'll commit to that. I know we, we, we've agreed to two, but there's a lot of stuff here and I, I want to make sure that you see all of it. And so I think, um, I think I can commit to two and a half. So uh, let's get started. Um, and uh, before we do, let's just make sure that you're all uh, able to do the chat. Let's make sure, okay. Bear with me for a second. Uh, hey, Karina, in your opinion, should I go ahead and start? Yeah, I think you can. Okay. Um, if you are able to, oh, I see, go slower, go faster. Okay, cool. Um, if you're able to do the chat, just uh, in the chat, tell me, uh, tell me that you're ready. Just, just give me a ready. And let me see who's, assuming you have, you're in front of a keyboard a keyboard and can actually type stuff. Let me just make sure everybody's here and paying attention. Don't watch TV while you're doing this because I am going to go fast uh, and this is going to be important. Okay, we got some people chiming in. All right. Uh, Trevor, Mark, uh, Jenny, Renell. Okay, cool. Ready with eating dinner. Okay, well, I won't, uh, I won't say anything that causes you to spit your food out, uh, at least not initially, Jenny. So you, you're probably safe for a little bit. All right, so here we go. So um, most of you know, some of you know, that uh, uh, I've been investing since 99. Uh, with the exception of the very first deal that we did, uh, we have never borrowed money to buy investment property. Um, we got to around $6 million. Um, actually, I think we were higher than that, but whatever. We had millions of dollars in real estate assets acquired uh, before it all came crashing down. Uh, but we did that without going to banks. And primarily what we did is we reached out to tired landlords and 
sellers in trouble. This presentation is entirely aimed at tired landlords uh, because there's certainly still plenty of sellers in trouble, but the time for tired landlords is now. And I'm about to demonstrate to you why that is. Um, so the purpose of this presentation is to talk about how to reach that group of tired landlords. I will define that in a minute and participate in what will be the greatest wealth transfer uh, in US history. Um, so let's talk about that. Okay. Uh, um, I'm not gonna ask you to, to, to poll, but imagine how many baby boomers, folks born between 1946 and 64, um, are gonna reach retirement age, that is to say 65, every day every day this year, every day next year, every day for the year after that. Um, venture a guess in your mind, form a number and just think about it, hold that in your head um, and then see the actual data. 10,000 people a day are going to be reaching retirement age. Um, now, all these people are not landowners, uh, landlords. So I'm not suggesting that everybody that's a baby boomer is a landowner, but what I am suggesting is that there's a big chunk of the population that owns rental property that's, that would love to retire. And the baby boom is this huge demographic cohort that's working its way through the, the system, the, the kind of gross metaphor that someone described to me is like a, they said it's like a puppy in a python. So this, the snake swallows the puppy and then the puppy kind of moves through the, the digestive system of the snake. Um, that's what's happening to the baby boomers. They're, they're moving, this big bulge of people is moving as they get older uh, across the, the, uh, the, the demographics of the United States. So that, and, and every time that they have, that, they, that, that something has been their time they have changed the rules of the game. When it was their time to go to college, they changed college. And when it was their time to, to get their first job, they changed uh, how jobs were gotten. Now that they're retiring, they're, they're changing how retirement works. They're changing how we define retirement. Um, but just keep in mind that every single day for the next several years that you wake up, just click in your head, 10,000 people, 10,000 baby boomers, are hitting 65 and figuring out what they're going to do with their with their lives, and some large percentage of that of that number are people who are uh, owners of rental property. Uh, in the same uh, sense, how many baby boomers will have reached retirement age by 2030, which is not that far from now? Um, how many in 10 years will have reached 65? The answer is an astounding 70 million, which is to say, all of them all baby boomers will have reached retirement age by 2030. So uh, I am the youngest baby boomer. I'm uh, born in 64. Um, and um, in my mind, I got a good 10 more years. Well, I'm not planning to retire anytime soon, but my intent is to be in a position where I don't have to work very, very soon. I'll probably be a, a landlord a lot, lot longer than that. But there was a huge uh, demographic chunk of the population that is heading towards retirement like a speeding freight train. And as they do that, many of them are shedding assets. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's, let's dive into, I want to talk about a tired landlord dream deal. Uh, and uh, this is a two, two bedroom, two, uh, two two bedroom, two and a half bathroom townhomes. Hey, Jason, um, I will go ahead and admit you. Uh, we're just getting the ball rolling. Um, this was Cobb County, Georgia. Um, I don't typically, I'm not typically a fan of townhomes, but these were two side by side townhomes owned by the same owner. And um, this is a deal that we actually did in 2017. Um, it was occupied. The tenants weren't awesome. It was what I would call under rented, which is to say that the landlord wasn't really doing a very good job of landlording and wasn't getting the full rent that he could get, which is common for tired landlords. Um, and so he really wanted out and he didn't want to deal with the tenants any longer. 
he owned these properties free and clear. There were no mortgages on them. He had bought them um, and paid off all the, the debt so that he, he held these without any encumbrances at all, which is a dream for uh, an investor because uh, we were able to buy this thing with owner financing. So while we bought both properties for about $200,000, we only paid him about 16,000 down. And then the remaining, what, 184, we structured as um, payments over time, which is pretty cool. But that's not the cool part. That's not the really cool part. The cool part is that we did this with 0% seller financing. In other words, the 184,000 that we owed him, we pay that by taking 184, thousand dividing it by however many months we, we were going to pay him over a period of time and that's what we paid him so in other words there was no interest payment being made on that money we just paid him what we owed him it's like if you owe 180 some odd thousand dollars and i say i'm going to pay you a thousand dollars a month until paid off then every single payment that i'm making all that payment is going straight to principal none of it's going to interest that is an interest free arrangement that's like finding unicorns, um, building rainbows. It, it just, it's, it's, but it happens. I mean, this guy, we didn't have to twist this guy's arm. Uh, this guy willingly accepted this for both properties. And uh, I'm not giving the addresses because this is actually two deals that we're actually still in the middle of. Um, but um, trust me when I say that uh, once we, um, were able to see the rents increased. Uh, he was probably uh, under renting by about two to 300 bucks uh, per month each. Uh, the cash flow uh, went through the roof and the cash on cash return ended up being something like 14%. And it would have been higher if he had done these as, if we had structured these as lease purchases. And we ended up doing these as straight rentals indirectly. Um, but 14% cash on cash, 16,000 down to control $200,000 worth of real estate, 0% financing with a huge amount of upside. This is a dream deal. And this is the kind of deal you can get with tired landlords. So let's go ahead and define what a tired landlord is. Um, oh, whoops. Okay. Let's see if that, oh no. Okay. Fine. Bear with me. My slides are, oh, okay. We're figuring this out. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about what a tired landlord is, the, de the definition of a tired landlord. A tired landlord is somebody who is, has reached a point in their life uh, where they, for a variety of reasons, no longer want to be a landlord. It's very straightforward. Uh, the reason why they don't want to be uh, could be a bunch, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But the fundamental characteristic of all tired landlords is that they no longer see that rental property as an asset they see it as a huge liability. Even though it may be an asset on their balance sheet, mentally it's a liability. They dread thinking about it, they dread talking about it, they, they just don't wanna deal with it. This guy was, as I recall, in his 70s, he wanted to retire and he didn't wanna deal with these tenants any longer. And so he sold to us. And I just wanna make, make it clear that the deal that we did with him was not a bad deal for him. He got to, shift from being a landlord collecting rent from these two tenants or from tenants to being the lender, just getting a check. He doesn't have to ask us for the money. He didn't have to go chase after us. He's not fixing anything with respect to the house. He's not worrying about, you know, is the lawn being mowed? He worries about that as much as Wells Fargo worries about it for anyone else's home mortgage. Wells Fargo doesn't care how high your grass grows. As long as you pay them every month, they're happy. So he can sit on a beach and collect a check for as long as he wants to and not lift a finger to get paid. And in the state of Georgia, if we were to act up and not pay him, he would take that property back, keep our $16,000 and go do that again with somebody else if he wanted to or sell it for cash. He actually makes more money if we don't do what we're supposed to do than if, he, than if we do. So the risk to him is hardly any. Um, so um, that's, my definition of a tired landlord. Why go after these people? Um, because everybody tells you go after motivated sellers. There's nothing more motivated than a landlord 
that has a tenant that they hate or a landlord that has a, uh, a house that they don't want to deal with um, any longer. It's, it's starting to need repairs. They don't have the money to repair it. So th these folks are motivated to sell. They have a, a burning reason why they no longer want to be involved, why they no longer want to be a landlord, and you don't have to convince them to sell the house. Um, also, they're flexible because in most cases, they understand how real estate works at least a little bit, enough to, to have been a landlord in the first place. So you're not trying to explain to them how landlord tenants situations work and the, the, the concept of accepting you know, payments over time. They get that. Uh, they understand how that works. And they also, what they care about and what you care about are different enough that you can get what you want while they get what they want. Uh, they're generally speaking, not money driven. They're, they're not driven by gain. They're driven by pain. Um, they are in the situation that they're in because they just, they can't imagine another day dealing with the situation that they've got. And so they're not trying to squeeze, I mean, they're not going to give it away, but they're not trying to optimize their profit as much as they're trying to minimize their pain. Uh, and that's not true for a lot of sellers out there. A lot of sellers really do want to stick around for the last penny to roll in, no matter how long it takes. That's not these folks. When you're 80 years old, you don't want someone to tell you, wait 20 years before you can take your next step. You may not have 20 years. So you want to get out there and start enjoying your life. And so having some money now is better than having a whole lot of money 20 years from now to an 80 year old. Um, and as I mentioned in the first couple of slides, there's a whole bunch of these people and they're more coming uh, to retirement age every day. How many? 10,000. So now that's, of course, that's the whole number of 10,000 baby boomers. I'm not saying that's how many landlords there are out there, but there's a bunch of them that are getting older. I mean, none of us are getting any younger, so they're getting older and they're getting to a point where they go, you know what? I just don't want to deal with these tenants any longer. So, um, I want to talk about the three flavors of tired landlords, uh, but I do want to throw this out there. I, I didn't have plan on talking about this, but it happened. I was talking to a colleague. Uh, today's Wednesday. This was Monday. Guy called me up uh, and said he's in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. And he called me because he ran into a guy who has a property across the street from the one that he's working on. Guy's 80 years old. He's got 40 properties in Lynchburg that he just wants to sell. He, he's a landlord, he's been doing this for 20 years and he just wants out. And of course, I almost fell off my chair because yeah, heck yeah, I wanna talk to this guy. And I wanna talk to this guy and wanna talk about financing and how we can set this thing up so that it, he gets what he wants and we, we get what we want. But this is going to be happening increasingly all around the country. And getting up to speed on it now is going to be uh, valuable for you and extremely powerful as you structure deals. Uh, I, I want to talk then about these three flavors of tired landlords because they are different. Uh, you've got the accidental landlords. Uh, I characterize these as the folks who had a property that they owned typically and lived in themselves. And then when they got ready to sell it, they couldn't find a buyer, but they had to move. So somebody that lives in Atlanta and got a, and got a job in California uh, and they put their house in the market and it didn't sell. And at some point they had to go move to this new job. So they left uh, Atlanta, let's say, and went to San Francisco. And now they live in California, but they still have this house in uh, Georgia that they have got to deal with. So they rent it out. They really don't want to be a landlord. They really want to be uh, done with this house, but they've got a mortgage payment underneath it and they just can't make that payment without having some income. So they put a tenant in and they, do the best they can. Their, their idea is that they'll bide their time until they can sell the house uh, later. These are people who don't really want to be landlords, but they don't really have much of a choice. They can either leave the house vacant and suck it up every month uh, in mortgage payments, or they can put a tenant in there and defray some of those costs. So they do that, but, but they're not trying to be major landlords. They're not looking for any more rental properties. They just want to get this property sold at some point in the future and move on with their lives. Uh, then you have uh, my favorite category, the folks who are just bad at their job. And um, I'll just be blunt. These are investors who don't have sufficient training at being a landlord. 
um, and they make a lot of rookie mistakes with their tenants, and their tenants eat them alive. Yep. Hey, Jason. Let's get you in there. Um, the tenants eat them alive and make them wish they were dead and make them not want to um, be a landlord anymore. Uh, we call these people professional tenants, someone who knows the law better than you do uh, and who understands exactly how to push your buttons and how far they can go and what you can't do as a landlord. And they make life unbearable for people who aren't good at being a landlord. And eventually those landlords go, I don't ever want to have another property. Get me out of this thing. I wanted to sell this thing and, and go paint in the forest. Um, so I like those folks because they are very, very motivated. And we'll talk about those folks later. But the group, the, the category that, that my guy from 2017 um, fell into was the old timers. These are the folks who, they know their, their job. They're, they're good at their job. They're a little bit behind the times. Uh, the guy in Lynchburg is still going around collecting rents physically, like going door to door on rent day and collecting rents from people. And I, I've heard this, I heard other people doing that in Atlanta as well. And if you've been doing that for the last 20 years, this is how you do it. You go to the house, you collect rent, you chat the people up, and then you move on to the next property. They don't know about ACHs and doing it electronically, and they don't really want to change. Um, and so they're not bad at their job, and they are intentional. They're not accidental, but they're old. I mean, and they're, they're old, not in the sense that they're, you know, decrepit and can't get around, but they don't want to do this anymore. They've been doing it for 20, 30, 40 years, and they're ready to relax. They don't want to talk about tenants and toilets and the rest of it. They want to sit on the beach and collect a check and move on to the next phase of their life. And so these are my favorite landlords because I get them. I understand them. I speak their language and I like them. Um, and if you can get them to like you, they will give you their properties at a very appealing, uh, at, with very, very appealing terms because money for them is not the big deal. Um, they just want to find someone who's going to who they respect and like and trust. Um, so uh, let's talk about how to find these folks because that's really what we're here to talk about. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time um, to do it. Uh, first, we'll talk word of mouth because um, I want to be fair to all the other ways of doing it other than the one I'm going to focus on tonight. Um, everybody knows um, a guy or a woman or someone in your market who owns a bunch of, quote unquote, a bunch of rentals. Um, and oftentimes, like this guy in Lynchburg, um, that person's easy to find. Um, people whisper when he walks down the street, hey, that guy owns 20 rentals, this guy owns 30 rentals. So people know who some of the people are that own rentals. Or if you're the old timer and you're going door to door, people say, yeah, Bob picks my rent up every month. Um, so everybody knows that Bob owns a bunch of rentals. Uh, so finding these people and working your personal network to find out who owns rentals and who's thinking about transitioning from being a landlord into the next phase is a viable marketing strategy. And you should be doing this just because. This should be part of your, your standard operating procedure. Uh, and I think I posted this to the group where everybody that knows you should know what you do. Everybody that knows you should know that if someone out there is thinking about doing something related to real estate, they should talk to you. Um, so you'll get the word about business anyway, but that is a way to find these folks. There's a more specific and direct way, and that is tax and title records. Uh, if you have access to the right systems, uh, typically associated with MLS, you can pop someone's name in and see everything that they own, assuming they own it in their own name. And a lot of these old timers do old stuff in their own name. So you can put John Smith, and if you know one property that John owns, you can go to that property, see who owns it, See how that name is spelled. Is it John or is it Jonathan? Is it, you know, whatever. Get that name, put it back into the search and say, show me everything that shows up with this name as the owner. And it'll show you every single, I know I can do this in Atlanta, every single property that that person owns that's in that name. And you can see, wow, this guy owns 12 properties in his own name, which is his own issue. We can talk about that later uh, on some other call. But, but if you could find people who had multiple properties, you could do a little research. How old are these people? Is that person 85? Hmm. An 85 year old is probably at some point going to be thinking about what do I do with all this property that I've got? So you could back your way into finding these people 
using tax records and title records. Um, same thing with title. You can get, get online and see who owns what directly um, and back into who those people are, uh, skip trace them, and um, reach out to them. Text them, call them, uh, email them, just find out who, who they are, who's, who's around them, and have they ever said the words, hmm, retirement uh, or transition. And if you can be there when those people are ready to uh, start shedding some of that portfolio, then you're off and running. I mean, someone's selling a 40 unit portfolio and you can pick up one or two, you don't have to buy them all. If you can pick up one or two, I think most of us would be okay with getting one or two killer deals uh, out of 40. I mean, if you could do all 40, that's great. But knowing who these people are means that you have that many more chances of getting yourself into a great deal. But by far, the reason why we're here and my number one method of finding tired landlords um, is evictions slash dispossessory. So in most normal states, uh, the process of a landlord getting a tenant, a non-paying or non-behaving tenant out of their property is called eviction. For some reason in Georgia, uh, they don't use the word eviction, they use dispossessory, but it, it means exactly the same thing. So I, I, I'll use them interchangeably because I'm uh, doing a lot of this in Georgia. So in Georgia, it's always gonna be dispossessory or dispo filings, but everybody else calls it eviction. The process by which a landlord seeks relief from a court to get a non-paying or non-performing tenant out of their property, that process um, is in most cases, pretty much in all cases, it's a lawsuit. It's a lawsuit that gets filed by the landlord. And because it's a lawsuit, there's a record of it in a court someplace. And if you had access to those records, you could see every single person who's filing eviction in a county, let's say. And then you could, for each of those people, in some cases, you can see the address of the property um, of the person who's filing the suit and the address of the property that's, that, that's the target that's, that, the, um, um, that the tenant's living in. Uh, and we'll, we'll see the exact data later on, but I just wanna, I wanna point out that there's a ton of information. And I did cover this in a video that I put out to the group uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we're gonna dive deeper into that, but there's a ton of information that's available for free to anybody who knows how to access it. And so that is what we're gonna spend the rest of this hour and a half talking about is evictions and dispo filings and how to use that to find these people and uh, get them to tell us how we can help them and help ourselves. Uh, let me pause right now because we're uh, at the one quarter mark and I wanna see if anyone has any questions. Um, if you can talk, feel free to. If you can't, type it into the chat and I'll take a look at it. Anyone have any questions so far about anything I've said? Are we all pretty much on board? Everything makes sense? We're good? Hey Mitch, uh, this is Mark. Hey Mark. I had a question about one of the first things you said about um, your, your first, the first deal, the Cobb County townhouse. Yeah. Uh, you said you were able to increase the rents by $300. Was that by um, getting new tenants or increasing yeah. the rents on the current tenants? Yeah, those tenants. Like getting new tenants? Yeah, those tenants, we, we were able to usher those folks to the door before closing. And we'll talk, not in this session, but in the next session, about how to deal with situations where there's a tenant in place, um, how okay. to either get them to pay you more or to get them out so that you can get somebody else in to pay more. But yeah, in that case, both tenants moved out before we closed. Um, and we helped the landlord get that done. That was part of the reason why he wanted to work with us because we were able to get them out without a lot of headache on his part. And he appreciated that. And that was, you know, it was just about having some expertise that he didn't have. Because sadly at that point, we'd had a lot of experience with uh, dispossessory. So we know how to get them out without it being a hassle. Okay, nice. Good question. Um, and, and of course, the, he was undercharging them on rent uh, that's a common dynamic for landlords, especially the old timers. Um, they get comfortable uh, and these people become their friends. A lot of them, a lot of them not, but a lot of them they are. And so they don't want to raise, you know, Mary's been living in this house for five years. I don't want to raise her rent. Well, um, I get that, but you know, my taxes go up every year. 
my expenses to go up every year, I think Mary should pay something every year. Maybe not 20% every year, but, but when we do re rentals, which really means lease purchase, our rents go up every year. Every year you're gonna see some increase, even if it's a token increase, it's gonna go, go up because we want people to get into the habit of understanding that stuff goes up. You know, you, we're not living in a, in a deflationary economy. Everything is gonna cost more next year than it does this year. It's just the way our economy works. So, so yeah, he was undercharging. We were able to, to capitalize on that by getting rid of those tenants. Had this been a three bedroom, two and a half bath, we, would have, we could have made even more money by doing these as lease purchases because these were townhomes, not condos. So they were independently owned, independently deeded. Um, and the people that, that moved in would have loved to have had the opportunity to own these, but people don't want to own two, two and a half. They want to own three bedrooms at least. So that, in the future, I would only look for threes, but in this case, it was a deal that fell into our laps. Uh, any other questions anyone else has got? If not, I will move Hi. on. Oh. Hi, Mitch. It's Jenny. Hey, Jenny. Um, so I had a question. Um, maybe you'll show this um, next, but you spoke about finding this information in the MLS on um, who owns the properties. Yes. Um, so I, I assume then you'll have to have access to it or have a realtor friend that can yep. access it. Yes, um, and um, I, I, sorry. Uh, well, I'm in Georgia and I, I can access the FMLS. Is that like the same thing? Yeah, so FMLS has a portal to something called Realist. Okay. And Realist, I pretty much live in Realist uh, because it lets me, when I put in an address, it lets me see the mortgages on the property, when it was bought, when it was sold, who bought it, who sold it, uh, whether it was ever listed, whether any foreclosures have been filed against it. I can see all that stuff in one system. It's, it's beautiful. And I can see that because I have a, an agent friend that gives me the hookup. So mm -hmm. if you have access to FMLS, you have access to that as well. Okay. Uh, awesome. And it is, it is glorious. Um, and if you don't have that, uh, for those, the rest of you who are either not in uh, Atlanta or do, who don't have access to MLS, this is why you need to get yourself an agent bestie that can help you do this research and in exchange you flip them all your referrals all the people that you talk to who say no I don't want to sell to you wholesaler or, or investor because I want to list my house you bring those people and say okay great I got a great listing agent for you Jane can help you get your house listed and then Jane is the one that helps you get access to MLS so getting that connection done is very straightforward and you will benefit greatly as will Jane and everybody will be happy but yeah, that's a good question. Um, so for FMLS, if you have FMLS, actually Georgia MLS has something similar, but FMLS is in my opinion is better and easier to use. Um, and that's how I get access to that data. Any other questions? Um, cool, okay, let's talk about, so we're gonna spend the bulk of this, uh, the rest of this time talking about evictions and dispossessory filings, because as you're gonna see in a minute, that's where the magic happens. That's how we found this guy um, back in 2017. Uh, he had filed um, eviction in Cobb County and we could find that data. And we found that data and we reached out to him and it didn't happen overnight, but eventually he returned our call and he said, yep, I'm ready to sell. And we were there to structure the deal and the rest is history. So let's talk about how to find uh, these folks, because that's probably what you most care about. There's three things you've got to decide, and I'm not going to talk just about Georgia. Uh, I know that we've got people here from um, all over, and so I picked, I think the first four people that signed up, I picked your areas, so we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you've got to decide uh, on jurisdiction. Um, so for example, let's just take Georgia because it's convenient. Uh, when I, if I'm a landlord in Georgia and my tenant's not paying me, um, I can file for eviction, for dispossessory, in a couple of different courts. I can file in magistrate court, which is like the lower court of Georgia, or I can file in state court. Uh, the reason why most landlords fi file in magistrate court is because magistrate court is cheaper, uh, and magistrate court lets you represent yourself without having to, to have attorney represent you. Um, so most landlords will file in magistrate. It's cheaper, it's faster, and you can do it um, online. And so, um, 
but that's, you'll need to find out the rules for your specific jurisdiction. Uh, and we'll talk a bit about that. I have a cheat sheet that will help you get started on that. But, but that is a decision that you've got to make. You've got to know uh, how that works where you are. And, um, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, some courts are divided by or, or have a, assignations of state magistrate. Texas, I learned, uh, has justices of the peace. Where Georgia has magistrates, Texas has justices of the peace. Um, but they perform the same function. But you have to know what that is. If you go to, if you go to uh, Texas looking for magistrates, you're not going to find it because they don't have that. Just like if you go to Georgia looking for justices of the peace, you're not going to find that either because that's not what they call them. So there's some terms you'll need to understand. And then once you can find a case, so every case, every time a landlord files uh, with, with the court seeking relief from a non-performing tenant, uh, that is a case. So if, if my tenant is late every single month and I file every single month, then there'll be a case for that tenant every single month. Now, the case may be resolved. Um, in our case, for example, uh, we are, in my opinion, pretty good landlords. So we don't let tenants um, rack up huge monthly um, back payment, back rent. We file, our rents are due on the 25th. If we haven't gotten paid on the 25th, we send a letter of uh, notice of, of pay or quit um, the 26th, and we're filing the eviction by the end of the month. So they have like five days to get their act together. But that's because we're good landlords. Bad landlords, as we talked about before, listen when the tenant says, oh, I'll get, I'll, I'll get caught up in a month or two. Just give me a break. And that month becomes two, becomes three, becomes four. And we'll talk about that in a, bit, a minute. But you get to decide when you're looking for these tired landlords, how do I want to, how do I want to assess the case data that I'm going to look at? For instance, uh, you could... You could use this, you could use the ability to, to access this data purely for information purposes. You could see, since every single case has to be filed to that county, if, if a property sits in Cobb County, then any time an eviction suit's filed, it's got to go through the, the courts to, to do so. So I can see every single eviction that's ever been filed for um, a particular landlord. I can search, in my case, I can search for landlord. I can search for by case number. I can, if I have all the data, I can look, I can sort it by address. So I can see for 123 Main Street, how many evictions are being filed in a year? And if the answer is zero, then okay, then, 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 then I guess they wouldn't show up in the system. If the answer is one, okay, that's not bad. If the answer is 12, if they're being filed on every single month, the same tenants being filed on repeatedly, that's the sign of a landlord that probably doesn't know what they're doing because if your tenant is late every single month, I mean, the fact that you're filing is good, but it means you have a bad tenant that you should be doing something with. And if you're just tolerating that every single month, you might, wanna, you might want to, as an investor, reach out to people like that. Or you might say, I, want to, I, only, want to, yeah, I only want to talk to landlords who have had uh, evictions, but they resolved it. Um, because I want to talk to people who, you know, have tasted uh, defeat, uh, that, have, that have had to go through the process of getting um, the eviction filed, but perhaps didn't uh, have to, to get rid of the tenant. Because the, the outcome of an eviction isn't always that the landlord wins. Sometimes the tenant wins. Um, and so if you track the case and the case is closed, but it's closed and the tenant won, you might, want to, you might want to check that, that out. But the, the beauty is that once you have all the data, you get to do with it whatever you want. You have the, act, the ability to assess and analyze that data as much as you like. If you wanted to use it just for trending purposes, wouldn't it be useful to know are evictions in my county going up over time or, or going down? Um, all that data is right there. Now, hardly anybody's pulling it because it, it, it requires some effort. But as an investor in, if, you're, if your market is Cobb County, wouldn't you like to know if Cobb County is seeing more evictions or fewer evictions or more of one type than the other or certain parts, certain zip codes are seeing a lot of evictions and certain other ones are not? So having that data is valuable in its own right, even if you didn't do a single deal from it. It's part of knowing your market. And now that once you understand how to get to that data, you'll have a, 
a level of understanding of your market that most people will never have. And so there is some value in this apart from your ability to structure deals, but we're here to talk about deals. So let's move on to the good stuff, um, which is let's get our hands dirty. So I want to, uh, you're going to get access to both of these, both the uh, cheat sheet and the crib notes. Uh, but I want you to see what we're talking about here. So and I'm, I'm going to click this and hopefully it won't scare the heck out of everybody. Um, can everyone see the spreadsheet? I hope. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so this is, and again, this is a work in progress. This is my actual personal spreadsheet. Um, so uh, you will have access to the link to this because it's a, it's a document uh, in transition as I add more markets that I'm interested in. Uh, and Frankly, I picked these markets because I knew Jenny was in Georgia like me. Um, uh, uh, Vernell is in New Jersey. Um, I think Mark is in Texas. Um, so I picked these based on you guys um, and, and me as well. I have, I'm looking at some deals in Cincinnati and uh, Karina and I are looking at deals in Vegas. So this is not by any means a comprehensive list of every single jurisdiction in the country. That would be way, way longer than this. Um, and I don't think such an, a resource actually exists. This is probably the closest that you'll get. Uh, but uh, these are color coded. So the, the colors relate to the state. Uh, and since evictions are typically done by county, um, for each county, let's pick on Georgia just to be, um, to start off. Um, Georgia has a bunch of counties. There's probably like 17 counties that make up Metro Atlanta alone. Um, and the larger ones, uh, Fulton's probably the largest, but Cobb is the one that I like. It's where we started doing our deals and it's where we do our deals, a lot of our deals now. Uh, Car As I mentioned, Cobb does uh, things primarily through the magistrate court and uh, they've got a system that lets you log in and um, access records. I'm not going to go there because we don't have that kind of time. This is, this is the part where you're going to, I'm showing you this because I'm going to want you, to, I'm going to dive into one of these in a minute or two, but um, my, my goal with this training is not to go through each of these and show you how the systems work because you really don't care. You just want the data, but I want you to see that the data can be had and what kind of data can be had. So we're going to pick on, uh, let's start with, uh, I think we decided we're going to do Gwinnett, I believe. Yeah, let's try Gwinnett. So um, there's some information here that I've compiled in my years of, of doing this. Um, and we'll talk some about, about some of this stuff later, but I just want you to see the kind of data that is accessible. Uh, yeah, let's do, let's do Henry since we're here. So Henry County, Georgia is, um, uh, popular county in Metro Atlanta. And I'm hoping you all can see that. This is their website. This is the, co the, the Henry County Court Docket Search website. And I've done this before, so this should already be in here. Um, civil dispossessory is what we're looking for. Uh, 2020 is the year. And I happen to know that this is a valid case. So, and again, I didn't log in. I didn't tell it who I am. Any of you can do, can and should do this, uh, if nothing else for the practice, just to see what kind of information is available. But this is a live case. Uh, this is active. This was filed in January 7th of this year. Uh, this is the case number. These are the parties. Um, just so that you know, in an eviction case, the landlord is always the plaintiff. The tenant is the defendant. So the landlord, the plaintiff, is the one that files the suit. The defendants, the tenants, are the ones that are the target of the suit. The landlord saying, hey, these tenants didn't do me right. And these tenants have to defend themselves against the assertion by the plaintiff that they're not doing what they're supposed to do. But here's what's, so I got their names, right? Amanda Hill, Dustin Moss, Sanji Johnson. Um, pretty cool. What's amazing is that there's a sequence of eviction slash dispossessory. 
and this shows the filing date. These are all the documents that were filed with the Henry County Court in the order in which they were filed. And uh, the initial suit, called the dispossessory, as I mentioned, is what's filed. And then the court has to show what they call service. So basically the parties that are named in the suit have to be served with documents. If you've ever watched a movie and some guy pops out of the bushes and hands somebody else a document and says, you've been served, they were served a document, a legal document, um, so that the court can know that they were notified of the suit against them. Um, and then the, the people who are served have the opportunity to answer. Um, if they do answer, the case is put on the calendar. In some cases, if they win, the winning party is issued a writ of possession, which basically says, hey, you have the right to now take your property back. Because eviction is all about getting the property back. It's not about getting paid what they owe you, it's about getting your property back. So the end of a dispossessory is typically the writ of possession. But it's, it shows you this right here. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is because if you were in Henry County, if you operated in Henry County and knew nothing about dispossessory, this is how you learn. You learn by going to actual cases and seeing how the forms are filled out, what they say, what they're asking, how, you know, how long it takes. If someone asks, how long did this, this, this take? Well, it started on the 7th. It was done by the 31st. That looks like less than a month to me. Um, but here's the part that blows my mind. Yeah, I can see documents. I can see live documents. So the dispossessory affidavit, which was filed by the plaintiff against the defendants, is this. Guess what? Phone number right there. Now, I don't care about the phone number for the tenant. I do care about the phone number for the landlord because that's the person I want to reach. So if I have that case information, I can now mail that person if I want to mail them. I can call or text that person. All the data is right here, as well as how much they're due, um, how many months they're due for, how much they're charging in late. I mean, all the information is here, as well as their signature, which is kind of scary. But all that information is here, available, free, and not behind any kind of firewall or paywall. So anybody who wants to, me sitting here in, in, in Lubbock, Texas, can access this information. And if this were a live case, I could pick up the phone, call this person, say, hey, Sanji, how's, how are things going with your case against uh, Amanda Hill at whatever, 335 Highland, whatever that is. Um, and if I had an interest in that property, I could do all my research, figure out if this is one that I want and go after her. Now, I just wanna say a couple things about this one while I'm here. Uh, past due rent of 1500 bucks is roughly what that looks like. Um, and um, so it looks like that plus the 100 plus the 7750 is where she's getting the 167750. Um, de December 1st, 2019 to January 1st, that means it's one month. So one month's rent is 1500 bucks. So one of the things I could do is see, well, gosh, for this property, is that fair market rent or is that above or below? If I looked it up and fair market rent is 2000 and they're only charging 1500, that tells me some valuable information about this kind of the, about this landlord that they're undercharging for rent. And I can use that information in my future negotiations. If I look it up and fair market rent is a thousand, and they're getting 1500 and I'll go, wow, gosh, that's impressive that they're getting 50% more than they should be getting in rent. Um, the fact that these folks did not let grass grow under their feet with respect to this non-paying tenant is impressive. It means that, you know, they're only one month behind. Um, I don't have an example to show you, but I've, I've seen some where the tenant is like eight months behind or nine months behind. And I go, how in the world can you possibly let a tenant go nine months without paying you rent? And the answer is, you're a bad landlord and you probably need to be put out of your misery by somebody who knows what they're doing. Someone like that needs someone like us to buy this property from them because they don't know what they're doing. And when you see someone who's got $10,000 in arrears in, in back rent that, that they're owed, you can imagine that they're hurting. They haven't gotten paid for 10 months. And again, this is not, this is pre COVID-19. This is not COVID-19 related. Um, and that's a whole nother factor we'll talk about. So I just wanted to point out the wealth of information. If you just wanted to focus on one little County in Georgia. Now, I don't want you to focus on one little County in Georgia because I want all of Georgia to myself, but for Jenny and I, who are going to be doing Georgia, this kind of information is gold. 
because this tells me a lot of information about this landlord, all their contact information. It gives me the property address. It gives me how much their rent is, how, what kind of a landlord they are, how, how proactive they are. And this is one record. And I haven't even spent any time trying to find out if they've, if they filed more than one of these. So this is, um, to me at least, magical. The fact that you can pull this kind of data in real time, live data, and act on it immediately um, is impressive. The guy that we did the deal with in 2017, we actually physically mailed him uh, a letter. And I'll make the, available, the, the, uh, the body of that letter available to you um, all. But nowadays, that was what, four years ago, five years ago, well, four years ago, um, almost four years ago. Um, nowadays, I wouldn't mail a letter. I would pick up the phone and text him um, or maybe stalk him on social media, see if I can find them that way. I do things that didn't cost me a ton of money and direct mail is not cheap. Picking up the phone and calling is cheap. Texting is cheap. Ringless voicemail is cheap. So, um, but I just want to point out the wealth of information that's here. Hopefully you see what I'm seeing here, that if you had this for every single case that you were working in Henry County, it gives you a ton of information. You may decide to only go after ones where they're two months behind or more. So this one you might throw back because it's too small a fish. Um, and that's often what I do. If, it's a really, if the landlord look, knows what they're doing, I'm not gonna waste my time trying to, to buy their property. I want, I want the ones who are the bad landlords. I don't want the good landlords because those people really want to be landlords and they're good at it. Let them do their thing. I want the people who really need to be put out of their misery uh, and, they, and they're, they're put out of their misery by people like me who can buy their property because they're not making any money. If your tenant hasn't paid you in eight months, you're not a landlord, you're a charity, right? You're, you're a Ronald McDonald house effectively. You're not getting any money for providing housing for people. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Um, I am not in the interest of time going to be able to go through every one of these, but what I provided you with is whether or not login is required. And you'll notice that most of these are not, the, in fact, only one of these requires a login and that's Cobb. Uh, I give you a, an example of a case ID and we'll talk about that in a minute, why that's important. Um, I give you some information about on, on the case numbers. Uh, are they consecutive? Or are they not consecutive? Uh, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Um, what kind of data is available? Sometimes you get landlord phone numbers. As you saw for Henry, it's there, but you can't, you can't get to it without going to the actual document. Um, so it's not part of the available data that you could cut and paste. You have to actually look at it. But I could have downloaded any of those documents and just had them in my, in my system. So uh, again, I didn't do every county, uh, and, um, but the Metro Atlanta counties are pretty large. So if you, if you just did this for Henry and you owned Henry and you worked Henry like crazy, you would do very well for yourself or just did Gwinnett or just did Cobb. I can tell you I'm focusing on Cobb and Gwinnett and to some extent Henry uh, myself, um, but uh, the data is here. I do want to talk about some of these other ones because I've got people on the, on the call. Uh, let's make sure that I have this right. Is there anyone on the call who is in Houston or works the Houston market? I thought there was. Well, think about that. While you're thinking about that, I know, uh, Vernell, because I asked you uh, what counties you looked at and you said Camden and Burlington, correct? Oh, you guys right. are chatting. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Mark's in Atlanta. Correct. Uh, can you hear me, oh, okay. Mitch? Yep, I sure can. Um, so, uh, yeah, you are correct. so let's, now you're lucky. Uh, you may not realize it because I didn't realize it. Uh, New Jersey makes it really easy. Um, it's one of the nicest systems I've seen. Um, so let's go there. And, uh, and again, I'm not going to do this for all of them, but I do want you to see what some of these look like. Uh, no, I did this without a password before. Bear with me. Uh, let's get creative here. I may have to come back to New Jersey. 
because uh, I did this. I it was on the Jersey site and I was looking at data and it was all over the place. Huh. Okay, let's see if I did do a login. Maybe I did one. No, okay. Um, let me, I'll work on that for, uh, oh, actually, frankly, I mean, Vernell, you're going to have the data. You'll have the link. And so it, perhaps for your um, uh, your one-on-one uh, -on -one session, we can, we can talk more about this. And that, that was actually my, my, my idea for the one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations that for those of you who wanted to, to get a little deeper and more specific in your situations, if you try doing this and you couldn't get the data working, uh, let's talk, because I, I did pull this specifically for each of you, and I was all over the uh, Camden. Now, it, it didn't mean anything to me, because I don't know that market, uh, but it's all there. Um, and it was, it was um, phone numbers were there. Uh, it was easy to get to. They didn't have documents. You couldn't download documents, but you could get contact information. Um, and right. uh, uh, so no one's on the call from Houston. Uh, I'll just pick on Houston just because it was, it was, their system was appealing, but I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'm about to tell you something that's going to make all this stuff irrelevant. Um, okay. So this is Harris County, which is Houston is Harris County. And let me go back and grab the, ID so I know this is a valid ID and that's sometimes the hard part is knowing what what the format is for the ID because all the areas are different so let's put that in and there we go so this is what eviction looks like in Houston and um, so I can see the data was filed. I can see, you know, the officer, I don't care about that. I care about the case number. I can see the names of the parties. I can get the addresses. Uh, this is the plaintiff. So this is the landlord's address. This is the property address. And so if I, if I work this market, I can see, do I want that property? Is it a property that I want uh, that I might, might be interested in? Uh, but let's kind of keep going down here. Um, yeah. Documents. Gotta love them. So you get to see the petition. And sure enough, for Houston, I get to see, you know, they even provide some additional information, you know, the rent per month, how, how far is on, how much is unpaid, um, when the notice was, I mean, you can see it here. I mean, I'm, I'm, my, my recommendation for those of you, even if it's not in your market, just get into the, into the habit of looking at the data because you start to, put together that it's not all that different from one county to the next, what they ask for and what they provide. Um, but he's telling me everything I need to know, right? Uh, what the problem is. So when I talk to this guy, if I were going to talk to this guy, I would only talk to him after I've read every single document that he's ever filed against this tenant, because I want to know all the details. Um, and I'm not going to tell him that I know all the details, but I'm going to know them all. And I'm going to be ready to make suggestions and structure deals based on what's going on already, because it's right here in public record. And anybody can, with, with, I didn't log in to get to this, right? So anybody who has access to a website, I mean, to a web browser can get this exact same data. And if I wanted to, I could download it into my computer. I mean, it's just, I, I, I it's beautiful in my opinion. Um, and it is, let me go back, if I can go back to, yeah. Uh, and the same thing for the, ah, so, so my point is, for your market, you should be doing this. I do this for Georgia just because I'm a sick puppy and I have nothing else better to do, but it's how you learn how things work. And some people, some clever landlord do things in their paperwork that others don't, and you get to learn, huh, I wonder why this person did that. I wonder why they, they phrased it that way. And you get to learn from other people's experiences. And it's just, to me, it's, it's just amazingly powerful, and it costs not a penny. And so uh, getting an education in how the, the court system works in a market that you care about when you're sitting 
thousands of miles away to me is just um, magic. So uh, again, I'm not going to cover them all, but you have, uh, and I'll find out what's going on with, with New Jersey. Cause again, I, I spent a ton of time in New Jersey and I was very impressed with how, how their system worked. Um, every city does not have a system. I looked for Lubbock cause I was going to be here anyway. Uh, Lubbock does not, Lubbock, Texas does not have, it's not big enough to have a, an online system that you can access on the web. They have a system, but you have to go to the courthouse, physically go to the courthouse to search it. And I'm not going to do that from Clovis, New Mexico. So that's, that market is closed to me. Um, Dallas, believe it or not, does not have a system that makes it easy. Houston does, Dallas doesn't. Austin, I'm still doing research on. Um, I found a system, but I haven't been able to find enough details yet. So I'm, I'm still, this is a work in progress, but my only point is it's there for a lot of the counties that, that are major enough that people want to do deals. Um, most, if not all of the counties in Georgia were there. I'm sorry, in uh, New Jersey were there. So I just picked these two, Vernell, because you mentioned them, but they were, they were all just laid out. It was just Greek to me because I don't know the different counties. Um, Vegas does not make it easy to get the data. Um, I don't know why, uh, but that's a challenge. Cincinnati, I'm looking at deals for something completely unrelated, but I figured what the heck, let me see what Cincinnati does. And sure enough, Cincinnati lets you get access to a lot of data uh, without requiring a login. So uh, this is, uh, will be the resource that I'm gonna be building on. You'll have a link to this uh, and can draw on it um, when you need to. I'll be updating it in real time. Uh, but uh, the beauty of this is that uh, if you are in any of these markets, to have a cheat sheet that lets you quickly get to where you want to be and start looking at cases and learning how things work is, in my opinion, uh, valuable, uh, if not priceless. Uh, the other thing that I had up was the crib notes. And I want to touch on this. Um, so... Yeah, I know I'm in it more than once. Um, let me see if I can get rid of myself here. Gets, there it is. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's a bigger pockets thing I'm working on. Um, so crib notes are uh, a breakdown of, first and foremost, you want, if you're going to do tired landlords, you have... I, my recommendation is that you understand the eviction process in your state. So if you're going to do eviction, if you're going to do title landlords in Georgia, then you should take some time to understand how Georgia evictions work. Like the fact that they call them dispos, not evictions, but also how long it takes, what the process is, what, what are the requirements, the legal requirements, um, because that's going to be a state. Okay, here we go. Uh, they have all this information available, so I just put a link to their uh, information. So if you want to know how it works in um, Texas, that link is here. Okay. I did not do that, so. Okay. Hopefully you guys are still, oh. Hey guys, if you're still with me, I'm having some computer issues. Bear with me. Hey, Karina, are you still there? Yes. Uh, what are you seeing on the screen? Because I... Um, the, the Tired Landlord Excel cheat sheet still. I feel like your audio is going in and out too, or maybe that's just on my end. Uh, I think my internet is having some issues, but let me see if I can get it fixed. Are you seeing anything on my on your screen? I'm just ah. seeing the Tired Landlord Evictions cheat sheet. Ah, okay. So my uh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Give me a second, folks. I'm having some issues with my internet connection. Let's see if that's... Okay, that seems to be better. 
I appear to be back. Okay, so uh, I think where I was is that if you are in Texas, there's a link for Texas. Same thing for New Jersey, there's a link. So this sheet is again, it's my cheat sheet that I'm sharing with you, or my crib notes, I should say, that I'm sharing with you for how to remind myself what does a case look like? What is a case number like in Cincinnati? What's a case? Because they're all different, right? There's no standard case. So I break it down so that I remind, remember that in Henry County, Um, yeah, I'm having some issues with the internet. I'm not sure why, but I'm just going to keep going. Okay, so let us, any questions about this? So again, you have access to both of these uh, resources. They won't be documents, they'll be links, because again, these are uh, living documents. I'm modifying them on a regular basis. I'm adding to them. Uh, but this is what I use to remind me uh, what a case looks like in Cobb County versus Gwinnett versus Henry. It's how I keep track of all this stuff because uh, trying to keep it in my head would, would uh, drive me insane. So um, any questions about this stuff so far? Uh, hello, yeah, Mitch. Right. Brunel, I'm yeah. Jersey. Hey, Brunel. Hey. Uh, I didn't get a chance to ask you the question previously, but uh, you said when you, when you found uh, tired landlords that were willing to sell their properties, that uh, because you had experience in the past with evicting um, tenants, uh, what what uh, what did you do for that? Was it was it cash for keys or, or what what did you normally do? And are you really interested in acquiring a property that has a problem tenant in it? How do you get around that? Yeah, um, so let's uh, that's worth talking about. Let me not. I, I don't want to get too far into this, but I do want to answer your question. The answer your question is um, most especially bad. Um, landlords or, or inexperienced landlords. And I, and I, I put myself in this category. When, when I was first, when I first started landlording, I would die before I would let the tenant win. So okay. any, any, any idea that I would pay the tenant to leave was not happening. I was going to fight this tooth and nail because they, they wronged me and I'm going to get them, the, they're going to pay. And as I get older and wiser, I realized if you pay the court, and um, the cleanup crew, $4,000, when you could have just paid the tenant 2000 to go away, you're making a huge, huge mistake. So uh, some of the simple suggestions that we can make to landlords is, hey, how about we just pay the tenant? And if the landlord has a problem with that, how about we, we will pay the tenant? You don't have to worry about the tenant, we'll take care of it. And then we go to the tenants and say, hey, look, if I pay you a thousand bucks, will you pick up and leave? And the tenant goes, heck to the air. So we go, great, problem solved, Mr. Landlord, your tenant's gonna move because we don't have the emotional connection that that landlord has. So the tenant will listen to us and believe us and in many ways not believe the landlord because they have, they have history, right? They have a bad relationship. So I can go in as a clean, neutral third party and say, hey, I know that you had a rough time with this landlord. How about we just make, make it such that at the day of closing or the day before closing, you have all your stuff out when you have all your stuff out, you bring your keys with you to the attorney's office, you give that attorney the keys, you sign this document that you're out, and he will give you a certified check, funds check for a thousand bucks. Does that sound good? Yep, cool. Then they do that. The minute that the attorney gets that, those keys, we change the locks, we uh, start cleaning up the property, uh, and we uh, give them the money. Um, and so, yes, cash for keys is one. Um, being a neutral third party that's not emotionally involved is, is huge. Uh, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but a lot of this stuff is just interpersonal um, garbage. And if you can get past all that and just look at it from a business standpoint, it's, the solution is obvious. But again, like when I was an inexperienced landlord, I just, it was, it was ego. I am not going to let the tenant win. We're going to fight this tooth and nail. And that's not how businesses run. Businesses, you look at the numbers and decide if it's worth it to fight this. And if it is, you fight it. And if it's not, you move on. So uh, we have paid tenants to move. And if the landlord won't do it, we'll, we'll make it come out of our part, uh, of our share, happily, uh, because we're going to be the ones having to deal with these people anyway. So we'll get them paid so that they move out, so that you, Mr. Landlord, can sell your property to us, and one less thing for you to worry about. And so they they love us. Uh, understanding how the process works means a lot of bad landlords don't understand how to handle, like in Georgia, 
and I'll just throw this out there. This is a throwaway for those of you who are thinking about being landlords. Uh, everybody talks about why don't you want to accept, uh, give your tenant your, your uh, checking account so he can make deposits directly into your account. Well, in Georgia, if you file a, a dispossessory suit and you accept any money before that suit is resolved, you have to start from scratch. Well, how do you define accept? If the tenant, and this has happened, if the tenant the day before court deposits $1 into your account, and then when you show up in court, the tenant says, your honor, I paid him yesterday. And you go, you didn't pay me anything. He goes, here's a deposit slip, your honor. And the, the judge will look at the slip and say, yep, he paid you, you gotta start from scratch, sorry. And a smart tenant will beat out a, 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 an unknowing landlord every single time with that strategy. So. I'm not a big fan of payments that don't let you lock them, payment systems that don't let you lock payment by the tenant, because in Georgia, at least, tenants can play that game until you catch on. So I think Cozy is one of, the, one of, one of those systems where the tenant can pay anytime they want to, you can't stop them when they, when they pay. That's why I'm not a big fan of Cozy. It had nothing to do with the concept, but if you can't restrict payment, then anytime you file an eviction, if they put $1 into your account, you gotta start from scratch. Um, so things like that, um, knowing how the, how the process works, knowing how to, how to beat that. There's, Cause there's a way around that. That's a, that's a very tricky situation, but there's a very simple solution and it's called the consent judgment. And so my only point is that I've got, sadly, I've got a whole lot of experience with this. And so you don't have to have a ton of experience, but as long as you know more about the process than your, than your landlord does, then you'd be in a good position to, to take this to the next step. Uh, and you'll learn more as you do more. And so, Believe it or not, most of the people that we talk to who are landlords, either accidental landlords or um, bad at their job landlords, have no idea how this process works. They file the paperwork and they show up at court and they hope for the best. And they get slaughtered in many cases because they don't know what they're doing. The, uh, the old guys, the old timers know how this works and so they understand it, but the other two categories have no clue what they're doing. And so anything that you know is typically way more than they know about the process. And just knowing how long it takes and you know, what's involved, I typically recommend people go to your eviction court. I mean, the old days before COVID-19, go sit in on a, an eviction. Don't have, you, don't, you can sit in the, in, the, in the back of the courtroom and just watch evictions go through and you'll start to pick up who gets you know, their way and who gets rejected by the court uh, for, for just how they said something or how they presented their documents. I mean, it's, it's crazy that it should be based on things like that, but it is. And so the more you can know about that process, the more you will be a, a huge resource to these landlords who don't know what they're doing. Does that make sense? For now? Uh-oh, did I lose you? Please tell me I didn't tell that for... Yes, you did. Okay. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was just getting scared there because I've done that before. Uh, I see there's chat. And again, I apologize. I'm not a uh, I'm, I'm, it's hard for me to chat and talk at the same time, or at least to read chat and talk, but I will take a look at it. Uh, audio, yeah, I know, it's going in and out. Uh, hopefully it's better now, hopefully it's stable. Uh, I think I was having a wave of bad internet a while there, but I think we're back. And as soon as he says that, it dies. <sighs> okay, I'm not gonna fill around with it. Yeah, sorry. As soon as I said something, it got bad. Uh, let me just get out of here and get back to where I was before. Okay, so uh, you have the crib notes, you have a link to the crib notes, you have a link to the cheat sheet. I urge you to, I can't, in two hours, in, in, in two days, I couldn't teach you everything there is to know about uh, tired landlords. I wanted to give you enough with this session and the next session so that you can get into the data and start walking around it yourself for your market. Um, and so, um, that's my goal here. So let's move on. I do have more stuff to cover, um, but we did get our hands a little dirty with the data sheet, uh, data cheat sheet and the crib notes. So now you see that the data is there. You can access the data. You can walk around in it, uh, play around with it, learn from it. Um, I use it to see if I find landlords that I like, that I think are smart, I'll look to see how they do stuff. How do they file documents? When do they file? Um, so there's a lot you can learn just by seeing how other people do stuff. And if you have access to the actual filings, the actual documents that they're filing, there's a ton of useful information in that. Um, so I would urge you to take advantage of that. Uh, let me see. Okay, cool. 
So um, I did want to talk about, so there's a ton of data that you are going to have access to when you pull uh, information from these websites. And we'll talk in a minute about how you pull it, but I do want to talk about some of the criteria that you want to use to screen these. Um, and I just want to remind you, every eviction has to go through this process. So when people talk about foreclosure, they typically talk about it solely in this, from the standpoint of the bank taking back ownership of the property, of the deed. And that's true. When a bank forecloses, the bank forecloses on the owner, and now the bank becomes the owner, assuming nobody bids on it. Um, however, there's still people living in the house, right? Those people don't just move out when the foreclosure happens, usually. And so the bank now has to go and evict those people that used to own the house. So there's, there's going to be an eviction suit for every foreclosure that happens because the bank wants possession of the property. Getting the deed is great, but you got to actually get the people out so you can get possession. So that means filing an eviction. So you can see every, for every single foreclosure, eventually there's going to be a corresponding eviction or dispossessory to get those people out of that property so that the bank can get that property back. So you get to decide if you're going to screen those out. I typically do because I don't need, I'm not looking for, for foreclosed properties. I'm looking for active landlords that are doing a bad job or that are inexperienced or that are don't wanters or, or tired in some way. So I typically, when I, if, I, if I had the entire set of data for this, for this year for Cobb County, it would include banks getting their properties back as a result of foreclosure. Every apartment complex in Cobb County that ever files an eviction is going to show up there as well. Um, and you can't, there's no such thing as a blanket uh, eviction. So if you're an apartment complex and 20 people in your complex are, are late, you've got to file 20 individual suits. And then they show up as 20 individual cases. So when you look at the data, the vast majority of it is going to be for apartment complexes, which just as an aside, if you're a buyer of multifamily properties, wouldn't you perhaps want to know which apartment complexes are seeing a ton of, of um, um, evictions? Might that not be useful information if you're trying to target multifamily purchases? I don't know. Maybe. So I typically go for um, properties where the owner is not an entity. So if I see an LLC or a corp or an inc, I typically leave those people alone because accidental landlords don't form corporations to manage their property. And bad at their job, the landlords don't typically, they may in some cases have an LLC, but uh, I don't typically go after those. I often really want to go after the individuals. I want to go after the, the Jane Doe's and the John Smith's that show up in the systems, not the ABC LLC and XYZ Corporation. Because my thinking is, the way I, for what I'm looking for, I want the, I want the Sadly, the weak members of the herd. I want the ones that are that are not, you know, running as fast as they can, and that that you know I can I can catch easily because they're slow, um, and that's going to be individuals. So for me, I use that to screen out that entire list of data that you might get, down to just the individuals. I get rid of the corporations. I get rid of the apartment complexes. In some cases, um, in some jurisdictions, you can also file. In addition to filing personally, you can file. You can have an attorney file on your behalf. I typically ignore those as well. If you're, if you're in this enough to have hired an attorney to represent you, my thinking is you're probably not somebody that I'm going to get a deal from. I could be wrong. I'm not saying that this is the way to go. I'm typically saying this is a, this a decision that you make when you're looking at the full set of data. And you can make that decision once you have the data. And you'll have to make the decision for yourself what kind of landlord you're looking for. But all the data is there. Um, same thing for, um, I mentioned this, single family versus multifamily. Uh, consider this, if, if I'm selling, if I'm looking for single family homes and I see a, um, uh, a dispossessory, a, a, an eviction case for a single family home, I'm interested because it's a single family home. If I see a fourplex and I see a, an eviction dispossessory, I'm interested, but not as much because again, it could mean that just one out of those four units is um, having issues. The other three could be working just fine. And from a cash flow standpoint, the owner of that property 
could be just getting rid of this bad tenant and putting somebody brand new in. So if all four of them, if all four units were in Dispo, then yeah, then I'm interested because now they basically are getting no cash flow on a multifamily. But um, I'd want to see that data. I'd want to see how that shows up. And in the filings, the landlord has to specify what unit. You can't just say 123 Main Street if it's a multiplex. You got to say 123 Main Street Unit 1 or Unit 4 or Unit whatever. So I can see for that address how many cases show up and I can see what kind of turnover they're seeing over the course of a year. Are they seeing, am I seeing this property being filed every couple of months? Um, am I seeing with a brand new name, which is to say they're getting a brand new tenant every month? That may be a multifamily that I go after. All I'm saying is that as long as the data is there, you get to decide how you're going to interpret it. But knowing how to get it means you have access to all this information that you can use to achieve whatever your goal is. Um, for me, I'm primarily looking for single families, so that's where I focus. But if you're looking for multis, they're there. I just do, I ignore them. I push them to the side and I focus on the single family houses. But you may do the exact opposite. You may ignore all the single families and focus on just the multifamilies and particularly the ones that are maybe smaller, um, that are constantly having turnover. Uh, because that tells you that you've got a landlord that doesn't know what they're doing and is putting in tenants that are not lasting very long. And all that data is right there. And if you ask that landlord if they're doing okay, they may say, oh, I'm making money, I'm, everything's fine. But the data doesn't lie. If you're filing a dispo every single you know, month and um, it's a new tenant name every single time, then something's going on. And if I know that, then I can approach that person and try to buy that deal. Um, I see all the plaintiffs. And if the plaintiffs are filing in their own personal name, I get to see where their address is, whether they're filing the name or not. I get to see the address. As you saw, it shows the address of the plaintiff. If the address of the plaintiff is next door, I want to know that. If the address of the plaintiff is for a house in Georgia, is California, I want to know that too, because that tells me, hmm, out of state landlord. And might they be a bit more motivated to do something than somebody who's living two doors down? Possibly, but at least you know. If you have that information available to you, you can make those distinctions and make a ton of money um, just by having that data and being, being able to make those distinctions. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Oh yeah, my favorite. Um, and I said this before, Good landlords don't let bad tenants not pay them for more than a couple of days. Bad landlords let bad tenants go month, two, three, I've seen eight, nine, 10 months that the tenant didn't pay. Every month they had a good story as to why they couldn't pay and the landlord refused to file. And in Georgia, there's no reason not to file because if you file, you're gonna win. Right? I mean, there's no defense, not inability to pay in Georgia is no defense. Just because you can't pay, Georgia doesn't care. You're, you're going to get uh, ruled against and you're going to get, I'm going to get possession. So it costs a hundred and some odd bucks to file. You've, you, 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 for, you're, you're giving up thousands of dollars in rent for a hundred dollar filing fee. Why? Why would you do that? And, and it's because the tenant is convincing this bad landlord not to file. Um, so I look at how long it takes someone to file as evidence of how good or bad a landlord they are. If it stays, then they're good, they know what they're doing, and I leave them alone. Simple as that. If it's months, if they let the tenant get behind two, three, four, five months, those are the people I'm going after because they don't know what they're doing. And, and it's, it, the, the proof is right there. And if the rent's big enough, I've seen $8,000 in, in arrearages, and I'm like, who would let that pile up? And the answer is, a bad landlord. And uh, if you're not getting paid anything from your tenant, then anything I offer you is better than what you're getting right now because you're getting nothing, right? So those are the people that I want to strike a deal with. And there we go. Uh, so the size of the back rent, which is related to some extent to the filing delay, uh, is also relevant. I want to see how big, how big is this problem? If, 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 you, if you're owed 800 bucks, you're not that motivated. If you're owed 8,000 bucks, if you haven't been paid by a tenant long enough to rack up 8,000 bucks, you are motivated. And just to remind you, the eviction slash dispossessory process is not about you getting your money back. It's about getting possession of the property. So the court's not gonna get you a dime of that money. That money is, in many cases, gone. But at least it tells me 
that you're a bad landlord and that, and that you need to be saved from yourself. And so using that information, as I showed you a few minutes ago, that you can access for a lot of these systems, tells me who I want to go after first. If I see $8,000, in fact, I had one of those. I, I, I pulled the Cobb data, um, like, well, Karina pulled the, the Cobb data. Karina and I pulled the Cobb data about two or three weeks ago. And I found one that was like six or $8,000 behind. Um, and they filed back in March. And I, I reached out to them. They'd already sold the property. I missed it by like two months. And I was distraught for like a day because I knew we were going to have to sell. I mean, you can't be that bad a landlord and last. So those people are, are, are ripe and ready for the plucking. And whoever's there is going to get that deal. I, I just got there too late. So my, my loss. Um, yeah, let's talk about this because I've been talking about this live data and what it looks like. So let's talk about this from a high level. Um, the reason why I'm not, I'm not, I want you to dive into the data, not so much so that you can pull it all because pulling it all would take manually, would take forever. Uh, but that there are people out there um, called web scrapers. There are services out there um, that will, you give them a website and you tell them what you're looking for and they will they have software that they can design uh, to go out there and programmatically pull that data and stick it in a spreadsheet. And uh, in preparation for this call, I, so I've, I've, that's how we got our data for the last 10 years is we had, we built a system that does that. Well, it turns out that there's people actually who do that for a living. And so instead of having to build our own system, we're going to be hiring all that stuff out. And we'll, at some point, we'll talk to some of you about making available uh, some sort of a service for those of you who just want to get the data. Something that it can be accessed from a website. There are people who can build software that can basically a robot that goes out and, and grabs the data, sticks it into a spreadsheet so that you wake up the next morning and you have a spreadsheet full of data. And if you did that for Cobb County, this is what it would look like. We started this uh, middle of this year. I wanted to look at the data right after, right before the, the uh, COVID-19. Uh, so I started um, mid-March and we pulled, this is every, every single case for Cobb County uh, up through uh, the end of, uh, around the end of uh, August. So it's all here. Um, all that's available is here. The address, the state, the site address, the, all the information that we talked about before. Uh, is, is here. And uh, just to remind you, this is, this is high level screening data. So at least this tells me uh, which of these are individuals, which of these are LLCs or limited partnerships. So I can ignore those because as I mentioned, I'm looking for single family houses, which of these are apartment complexes. So I can at least from a very high level start to eliminate all the stuff that I don't care about because it's not the kind of um, uh, eviction case that I, that I want. And then I can take this list of I don't know how many this was, I didn't count, uh, 13, 1,400, and maybe it gets down, I think we end, ended up getting it down, Karina and I, to like a couple hundred. Uh, and so for those, I can go back into the system one at a time and see, okay, give me more detail now. I could, if I wanted to, go back and look at the, the documents we were talking about before, because I'm not going to look at 1,400 documents, uh, but I can look at a couple hundred or maybe a couple dozen. And so I do, that's my homework. I do that work. My, my team and I, right now it's me, uh, I do that work so that I can figure out which of these properties do I want to go after uh, and how do I sort them? Which ones have a, owe a lot of money or are owed a lot of money? Which ones, um, which ones are, are in the category that makes me want to chase after them? And some are way more attractive than others. Uh, but having the data means I get to sit back and look at, I mean, if I wanted to sort this by apartment complexes, if I wanted to count how many you know, times this particular address shows up uh, in, this, in this database. I mean, it's all here, it's just a spreadsheet. I can, I can do all the stuff that you would do with the spreadsheet, all the analysis. I can sort this data by zip code, what zip codes are having the most eviction. I mean, it's all here. And if, again, if you're working Cobb County, you should know this. This is, this is gold to be able to get this information. So it has value, even if I didn't do a single deal from it, but 
I'm here for the deal. So I'm doing this because I want to be able to identify who are these people I should be chasing after to try to buy their property. Um, so uh, the, uh, if you add the web scraper concept for those people who have, who are working in areas where the, where the, the county or the, the municipality has a website, you can hire people that can build you software. Um, and we'll talk more about that uh, in a separate session to scrape this stuff for you maybe once a week. Um, because keep in mind that this is time, time sensitive. So today is the second somebody somewhere in Cobb County filed eviction today. And if I knew about that today, and it was one of the cases that I wanted, I could be calling them tomorrow. I don't want to wait two months to reach out to these people. I want to reach them real time because, or at least the day after they, they filed the, the um, eviction case. So uh, timeliness is important to me and being able to get this data um, in real time to be able to, to act on it before anybody else who's out there doing the same thing that I'm doing does gives me a competitive advantage. So uh, I want you to see the data. Again, I didn't pull the data for every single county because um, that would take a long time. I'm interested in Cobb. I pulled the Cobb data. This is what I'm doing right now. So chasing after tired landlords in Cobb County is my focus. It's what I'm trying to do to find more deals. And um, um, Gwinnett and Clayton and Henry. And uh, uh, yes, Jenny, I would do DeCab as well. I think DeCab has a pretty straightforward system. I think it's very much like um, Gwinnett's. Uh, I just hadn't gotten around to it, but, but it, it is, I'll be adding it to the list along with Fulton County. Um, but yeah, so this is, in my opinion, this is the real solution. You're not going to go and pull 1400 records because it would take you forever to, to take, cut and paste that into a spreadsheet. You're going to hire somebody or you're going to sign up for a service that does it for you so that all you're doing is looking at the raw data and deciding which of these records you want to dig deeper into and then which of those you want to actually pursue. Um, so that is why I wanted to do that. Um, because now we're going to talk about how to reach these people. Um, so you have the data, you've got the number. In some cases, you have a phone number. In some cases, you have an email address. Uh, in all, almost all cases, you have a physical address. So what do you do with that? Well, um, being a thrifty investor, I'm going to... Yes. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. Jenny, question? Uh, Lynn, it's... Oh, Lynn. Hey, yeah, Lynn. Lynn. Hey, um... If we wanted to buy this cheat sheet of the raw data, do you know if there's any places we can go about? So I don't know of any vendor that provides the data um, yet. Um, I'm looking into, frankly, becoming a vendor for some of these uh, because it's not just the data, it's knowing how to pull the data. Because some of this data is, is, is it, it's got to be interpreted. So just pulling the, the actual you know, characters is, is only useful if you understand exactly what you're looking at. But to, I've not found a service like a list provider that, that does uh, tired landlord data. Um, the okay. people that I know who are doing it have, are doing what I'm suggesting. Either they're building their own systems if they're so technically inclined or if they're, in my opinion, smarter. They're hiring people who don't know what the data means but can have the skill set to extract it and stick it in a spreadsheet and then the experienced investor can go interpret that data and make and make it make money good question uh, i wish there were if i could buy this stuff from somebody um i would uh, but actually to be honest i'm okay with the fact that you can't buy it because that means most people won't have access to it and believe it or not most people don't don't touch tired landlords because it's so so hard to get to um, and so that's why, honestly, I'm okay with not everybody knowing how to do this just yet. Um, but it will become more and more popular as people start to figure out that this is a gold mine uh, and very, very effective. Um, so text message is one of my favorite ways to reach uh, tired landlords if I have a phone number because it's fast. Um, and uh, if you were on the call uh, that I did today, the, the uh, Victory Lab with Nina Granbury, uh, that's how she's doing her virtual wholesaling. She's reaching out to sellers uh, by text message because for a generation of people, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention why that's a flaw in a minute, but for a generation of people, reaching them by text is a, is, is a way more effective way of, of getting to them than email or calling them because a certain generation 
responds to text better than they do email or calls. Having said that, you're not going to get many old timers by texting because a lot of those guys don't have text plans on their phone. They got flip phones, if, uh, not smartphones. If they do have a smartphone, they don't have a, a data plan, so they don't have text messages. So if you want to reach the 80 year old, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say that there are 90 80 year olds that are, that are tech savvy, but I would be willing to say that the majority of 80 year olds are probably not texting back and forth on a regular basis. And so if you want to reach those folks, you're going to have to pick up the phone and call or do my, my more favorite approach, which is ringless voicemail. Um, which is to say, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this, um, your, there are systems out there that can basically shoot a voicemail message to someone's phone without it ever ringing or it rings like half a ring or a quarter of a ring. And then they get a voicemail and you don't have to ever talk to them. You can just send them this message and it shows up in their voicemail as if you left them a message and then they go, oh, I didn't realize I missed a message and they listen to it and it's your voice. So you get to record your message in advance and then you can blast that out to a, a bunch of people. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving legal advice. I know that there are laws against ringless voicemail, but as has been explained to me by an attorney uh, in a public forum, um, that is for offers to sell product, for solicitations to sell. We're not offering to sell the landlord anything. I'm not trying to sell you a subscription to Time Magazine or a, uh, a stock. I'm trying to buy your property. So uh, the, uh, the laws that prohibit this kind of marketing are, mar are prohibiting marketing to sell product. We're not selling a product, we're buying a product. Um, and so his interpretation is that, that the, the laws that govern ringless voicemail and restrict that don't apply to what we're doing if, we're, if, you're, if you're soliciting people to buy their property. If you're soliciting to sell them on a subscription, then yeah, you would, you, there are laws that restrict what you can do. And there's some question as to whether that's even legal any longer. But the law in his reading, and therefore mine, since he's the attorney and I'm not, is that ringless voicemail to buy someone's property is not, is not an offer to sell, to, to sell them anything. It's an offer to buy something from them. So uh, take that for what it's worth, but I'm a big fan of ringless voicemail because having to leave a thousand voicemail messages in real time would take you forever. With one press of a button, you can have a thousand ringless voicemails going out to a thousand different phone numbers and it'll tell you which ones succeeded, which, one, which ones failed, and give you a nice little tidy report of, of the status. And you could be sitting with your feet up eating chocolate bonbons while it's happening. So in my mind, that's, that's way better. But for some people, you're gonna to have to pick up the phone and talk to them. This was Nina's point when she did her um, victory lap today. Some people are gonna only respond to a phone call, but when you're having that phone call, armed with all the information that you're armed with and with an approach that we'll talk about in a minute, you're not gonna be an annoying investor trying to buy their property for next to nothing. And we'll talk about why that is in a, in a second, but, but for some people, you are going to have to call them. Uh, direct mail is what we used to do in the old days. It's how we got that two deal um, uh, Cobb County arrangement. We sent him a, we mailed him a, a one pager, it may have been a postcard actually. Uh, he responded to the postcard and we ended up doing that deal. Uh, I wouldn't mind doing direct mail, but for those of you who have done it, you know it's not cheap. It's not cheap, it's not fast. And in 2020, I would much rather get a fast no than a two week yes. I'd rather know right now if you're interested in the property, I mean, in selling the property. So if I text you and you go, you know, go fly a kite, then at least I know you're not interested right now. And I can, and I can try you again later on and maybe I can direct mail you later on, but I'd, I'd rather get that quick answer than wait a week to see if the direct mail worked and if you saw it and opened it and, and responded back to me. Plus it's text messages effectively free because I use Google Voice, so that cost me nothing. Um, and I'll throw this out there because I've done this. Uh, if you have a situation, if, you, if I had found that $8,000 um, back rent woman in time, I, wouldn't, I might have texted, I might have ringless voicemailed, I might have called, and I might have direct mailed. If I didn't get any satisfaction, what I have done is for $8,000, well, for, for that much in arrearage for a house that I really want, I'll pay the 10, 15, 20 bucks to do FedEx to them. And in that FedEx, 
I'll do something like a lumpy mail. I'll put something in there that's thick, that's not flat. So then when they get it, they, and maybe that makes sound when they shake it. I think I used to use poker chips. Um, so that when they shook the package, they made a sound, it makes them want to open it up and see what's in there. And they open it up and they see my balled up uh, sales letter and they go, what the heck is this? They open it up and there it is my pitch, whatever that letter is, at least they get, at least I got it opened and read. And from there, it's, it's up to my copy to do the job. Uh, but if it's, a, if it's a deal that I really, really want, and I'm not going to fly from Clovis, New Mexico to Atlanta to their doorstep to, to knock on their door, I will let FedEx do my dirty work for me uh, because people respond to FedEx packages. I can't do that for everybody because it costs too much. But for the deals that I really, really want, um, it works. Um, and you get to decide how much you're going to spend. But uh, if you absolutely positively need to get the deal, people will open a FedEx. It's hard for you to get a FedEx and not open up and see who it came from and what's going on. So uh, I'll just throw that out there. Uh, let's talk about how to connect with these folks. Um, because no point in getting to the point of marketing to these people, they call you back and then you get on the phone and you blow it because you sound like every other investor that just sat in on a seminar and wants to buy their house for 10 cents on the dollar. Um, so my, my, my plea to you is don't do that. The way we got this guy's two deals in Cobb is we solved his problem. He wanted to be free of these tenants. He wanted to sit on a beach and collect a check every month, which is exactly what he's done since 2017. Uh, and he wanted to not have to deal with any of this any longer. And we solved all those problems by listening to him and letting him tell us what the problem was. And this is a philosophical issue that I have with most investors. Most of us, and I did this when I first got started, we talk too much. Our job is not to talk these sellers to death. Our, point, our job is to listen to what they have to say and let them tell us where it hurts. We are the doctors of selling. Um, it's our job to sit back and let the, the patient tell us it hurts here, it hurts there, it hurts when I do this, it hurts when I do that. And we just sit there and go, well, how about this? Try that. Does it hurt when you do this? It's our job to ask those questions so that they can tell us exactly where it hurts. And that has nothing to do with us. We're just there to, to hear. We're not saying, we're not thinking, okay, well, if he says this, I'm going to try to buy his house that way. Or if, he, if she says that, I'm going to try to do this. Just listen and try to understand what they're saying without having a, 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 any specific agenda. I'm just here to help. I'm just here to see what I can do to help the situation. The, the dual benefit of that is it works, which is probably the biggest reason, but also they'll want to talk to you. They don't want to talk to the other people who just want to talk about how they can buy their house for 10 cents on the dollar. They want to get off the phone with those folks as fast as possible. But when they talk to you, A, you listen, B, you, you, you echo back to them what you're hearing uh, in ways that are helpful to them, and you know more about the process than they do. So when they say, well, my tenant's going to do this, you can say, hey, uh, have you prevented your tenant from making payments to you while you file this eviction? Because if you don't, and they give you any money, you got to start from the beginning. Or have they paid you any money since you filed this? Well, they did. Well, you got to return that money. You have to show that you returned it and lock them out so they can't make any more payments. Otherwise, you're going to have to start from scratch. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, now you're the answer guy. Now you're the person that, that knows stuff that they didn't know. And no, you're not giving legal advice, but you're just telling them one landlord or at least one landlord adjacent person to another that you've seen or heard or read or understood this to be the case. They can confirm it if they want to, but these are things they may want to be, be wary of. So knowing more about the process than they do makes you effectively an expert. And it, it, it makes them want to talk to you because you know stuff. And you'll know stuff just because you've talked to a hundred landlords. Uh, you'd be surprised what you learn by, by talking to a bunch of landlords, even if you're not one yourself. Their stories become your stories because you will get to hear what, they have to, what they've gone through. Uh, you want to be the solutions hero. You want to be the person that's suggesting things that they weren't thinking about. Well, did you consider just buying them out? Did you consider just paying them cash for keys? Did you consider just, you know, letting them do whatever they want to do? Whatever the solution is, all you have to do is suggest it. You don't have to make them do it. All you can do is present the option. They could choose it or not. But if you present these things as options for them to consider and not hard sales pitch, I'm going to buy your house whether you like it or not, and there's nothing you can do about it. Those people don't get called back, and they annoy everybody that they talk to, and they never get a lot of repeat business. 
Uh, the people who are solutions heroes are champions to the, whoever they talk to and they get tons of referrals because that's me. That's, I get people who say, oh, I didn't even buy, he didn't even buy my house, but he helped me out. And so they'll refer me to somebody else and I'll get business from someone that I didn't even do business with because they liked me because I helped them. Uh, it's crazy, but it works. Um, and then this kind of leads me to my next thing. And I think I've talked about this in the group. This is the see the big picture. And I've said this, I know before, and I'll just, I'll make it clear right now. If you talk to a bunch of tired landlords, the only reason why they wouldn't want to do your deal is typically is if you, assuming you give them all the solutions that they, that they offer, that they, that they need is because of the numbers, because they want a hundred and you can only pay them 90 or whatever. When it becomes that kind of an issue and they really are set on their number, maybe you can't buy it as an investor. Maybe the best thing for them to do if the property is not in horrible shape is for them to list it. And this is a callback to what I said before about finding yourself a, an agent best friend to work with because if you're standing in front of the landlord and they're adamant that they're not gonna sell it to you for anything for a penny less than 100 and you've worked your numbers and know that no investor could buy this property for anything more than 90, then you might say to them, gosh, sounds like we can't make this thing happen for you as investors. Have you thought about just listing your property for sale and seeing what happens? If they say anything other than, yep, I'm doing it right now and it's listed. If they say, well, I'm thinking about it or well, I would, or I'm, I maybe at some point down the road, or yes, I'm gonna do that. Then your next statement should be, well, hey, I've got a great agent that I can recommend to you who lists properties. Can I get them on the phone right now so they can talk to you about how they can help you sell your house? If they say yes, you call that agent and say, hey, Mary, or in my case, hey, Marta, I've got, a, I've got Mary Smith standing here and she's at 123 Main Street. She's trying to get this house sold at 245 Oak that she's a landlord on. What do you think you could get her for it? And then Marta says whatever she has to say. And if they can strike a deal, I'm a hero. I am not getting a penny in benefit from Marta. But when I asked Marta for access to FMLS, guess what? She's thinking, well, gosh, Mitch helped me out by getting me a, a, a listing, a referral, and didn't ask me for any of my commission. Sure, I'll, I'll run that report for you. Sure, I'll take a look at that comp for you. Sure, I'll help you out with that, whatever I can help you out with. That's the currency of, of, of business, it's, it's favors. And if you can give first, you will get. So when I say feed your network, I mean, refer to your network, refer to your contractors, refer to your brokers, your agents, your mortgage brokers, your insurers, all those people that are in your network, make sure that, that if this person that's in front of you needs anything that they can offer, that you make that connection right then and there so that it doesn't get lost. Because what I used to do is they go, oh, I'm gonna list it. And they go, oh, okay, thank you, and I'd leave. And then I'd come back six months later and the property is still not listed. And I'm like, what the hell? You said you were gonna list it. Oh, well, this got, you know, I got busy. I didn't get a chance to do it. So now I don't leave it to chance. I'm not leaving this room. If you tell me not to call her, I won't call her. But no one ever says don't call her because they wanna hear what she has to say. And since I know Marta and I know she's awesome, I'm happy to make the connection because I know she's gonna take great care of them. And she's gonna remember that I made that connection, that the landlord's gonna remember that I made that connection. Will I get any money from that deal? Not a penny. But Am I feeding my network? Yes. Am I, am I seeing the big picture and making value for somebody else? Absolutely. And will that benefit me in the long run? Yes. So if I can't do the deal, I'm at least not going to leave until somebody in my network gets something out of it, if I can. But I'm not walking away without asking the question, uh, what else do you need? Uh, if they need repairs done, well, gosh, I know a great contractor that's trustworthy and reliable and, they can, and does great work. Can I put you in touch with them? Um, if you have a network, this is how you want to use it. This is how you want to build it. And oh, by the way, get all these people who owe you favors. And you're not going to, not, not owe you in the sense that you're going to keep track and say, yeah, well, I did this for you, do that for me. But they're not going to forget. They're not going to forget that you sent them a ton of listings. Um, and that, that landlord's not going to forget. Oh, and I should mention this. Landlords, especially the old timers, own more than one property. So often it's the case that the one you call about, and this was, I think, uh, what Nina said today, the one you call about isn't the one that they want you to work with them on. They may go, this one I got covered, but I got three over here that they're killing me. Can you help me with those? 
And if you're the answer guy, if you're the solutions hero, uh, then they're going to suggest that property because you were so helpful on this one. Well, can you help me with these other ones? And now you're in, now you're there, their advisor. Now you're their trusted advisor, not that annoying sales guy who's trying to steal my properties. And um, you, you can do all sorts of incredible business that way. So see the big picture. Uh, and don't be small minded about the opportunity because especially those old timers, they know, a, they know they have a lot of property themselves and all their friends are old too. So they know a lot of people that are in the same boat that they're in. And once one of them trusts you and you do right by them, all those other guys are going to stand in line and to, to work with you. Not all, but enough of them that you'll, you won't have to chase after business. So um, I hope I made the case for why, you want to be very intentional about how you deal with landlords. And the good news about it is the more you talk to them, uh, they've got great stories. Most landlords have some really good stories. Uh, so they're entertaining to talk to and you will, you will learn from them and you can apply that knowledge to the next conversation you have. So you'll get smarter just by talking to them. Even if you've never had a tenant, just talking to landlords and hearing what they've done and taking their best practices and applying it to the next person you talk to means that by the, 30th or 40th landlord, you'll have a, an education in landlording, even if you've never had a property yourself. And if you have had properties, then you have immediate credibility. Oh, tenants, the worst. Am I right? Yeah, you can relate. We can both agree that tenants stink and we can start from there and, and build on that. So um, I think that if you do it that, my experience is if you do it that way, uh, you will be in good shape. So uh, we are, oh wow, only eight minutes uh, to the, um, seven o'clock, uh, which is the eight o'clock mark. So I'm almost exactly on time. I wanted to leave plenty of time for Q and A. Um, as I mentioned, this is going to be a two part training and I, I know I've thrown a whole lot at you and I've probably done it very fast. Hopefully not scared any of you off. Uh, but let me take a deep breath and pause and look at the chat and see if anyone has any questions about anything that I've said so far. Uh, because the next session is going to talk about the exact deal structures. I'm not going to go into it now. I'll give you the preview of coming attractions if you want, but um, I want to make sure that all, all the groundwork stuff has been addressed so that we can start the next session right from here and move on. So anyone have any questions about anything I've said so far in the last two hours? Those of you still awake or conscious. Yep, awake and conscious. No questions. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, let's see. Oh, no, I don't want to go there yet. Um, so I will, I will preview a little bit of this. Uh, I know we're going to have to cover it again, but I do. I mean, obviously, uh, the simplest deal structure for tired landlords is to buy their property for cash. Uh, everybody understands cash. You're never going to have any arguments from people about that. But in my opinion, it's not the best deal structure. It's the simplest, uh, but rarely does it serve both buyer and seller. Um, and so, and I'm pretty sure I've said this on the, in the, in the group as well. There is a question that you should ask for every closing that you ever do when you're buying. Uh, and I should probably get the language tattooed on my arm. Um, but the gist of it is, it's really not a, a statement. It's really a question. It's a, it's a conversation. But you want to understand what they're going to do with the proceeds. Not in a creepy, none of your business nosy kind of way, just in a casual, you've done well for yourself. You're going to take this and go buy a big old boat and, and sail up and down the you know, Atlantic, um, and they'll laugh and they'll go, well, no, I'm going to, you know, sit on the beach in Florida, or I'm going to go buy a house in Colorado, or I'm going to go give it to my grandkids, whatever, whatever they're going to do with it. But ask the question, what are they going to do with the proceeds? Because if they have a plan, if they have a specific plan for what they're going to do. I'm going to buy a, you know, McLaren sports car. It costs exactly $250,000. I want the red, I can get it the day after we close, I'm going to be in the, in the dealership getting it then fine. But if they go, well, you know, I'm not really sure you haven't really thought about that yet, but um, I'll probably stick it in the bank for a couple of months and just see what happens. 
then you need to ask the next question, which is, well, gee, if you don't need all your money up front, would you consider accepting terms for perhaps a better price? And then just hush and let them think about that a little bit and give you an answer. Because if you can get them to, if the property is free and clear, even better, if they own it free and clear, thou shalt not close a free and clear house without asking the seller if they need all their money, because odds are pretty good that they don't. If they have a free and clear house that they haven't put any debt on, they probably don't need the money, right? Because if they needed the money, they would have gotten financing on the property. So if they get all that cash at the closing, what are they gonna do? Stick it in a CD at what, 2% if they're lucky? They could, or they could take a down payment from you and then payments over time for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Doesn't that sound better? Would that perhaps solve some tax problems they might have? And again, you don't have to answer any of these questions. You just have to ask the question. And if you don't ask the question, every seller that you deal with is going to accept your cash and move on. And you're going to have left a perfectly good, potentially financed deal on the table because you didn't ask the question. No seller is going to say, hey, oh, you know what? I would take your cash, but I'd much rather you pay me in, in payments. No, no average seller. I mean, a sophisticated seller might, but most of them are going to, if you, if you don't suggest terms, they're not going to offer terms. Owner finance deals are not made. I mean, sorry, they're not found, they're made. Uh, and so the, every deal that we've ever done has been because we constructed it. Never has a seller come to us and said, hey, we want to structure this financing deal with you. Here's how it goes. The people who do that are investors just like us, and the deals are re rarely actual deals because they know what they're doing. And they're in the business of, of making money that way. The average person who's just trying to get paid on a deal that they've done just wants their money back. And believe it or not, some people can't handle a lump sum. For some people, the worst thing that you can, it's like dogs, when you give them an entire bag of, of dog food for the day, they eat themselves sick. And they shouldn't, right? They should be smart enough to say, well, I'm just going to eat till I'm full. And, but they can't do that. If the entire bag is there, they're going to eat the entire bag. Well, some pe people are sometimes the same way. If, you, if, they, if, you, if, you, if the proceeds are $100,000, they're going to blow $100,000. And they know themselves well enough to know, well, I'd be better off if I got $1,000 a month for the next however many months that is. And if they're, they're willing to go for that, you've just created an opportunity for seller financing, which is even if you don't need it, is gold. Because you could always, the day after you structure seller financing, come in and pay it off with cash, assuming there's no prepayment penalty. And of course, why would you set it up if you're doing it? If you're setting it up yourself, you wouldn't give yourself a prepayment penalty. So whatever the financing is, no matter how elaborate and fancy it is, you could always come in the very next day and pay it off in cash. If you decided, you know what, this makes me un uncomfortable, I'm, I'm not sure about this, fine. Pa cash it off the next day. But it's nice to have the option to be able to pay a thousand bucks a month as opposed to paying a hundred thousand bucks up front. And if the seller is okay with it, in fact, if the seller prefers it, then they walk away happier than if you'd done cash. So cash offers are fine. But for me, my recommendation is that cash is for investors who don't have the knowledge, the wisdom and the guts to ask the dumb question. Gosh, that's a lot of money. What are you going to do with all that money? You're going to go hit Vegas uh, I usually make a joke out of it and then they'll lose, lose, usually say, oh, no, I'm going to do X. And then whatever they say, that's what we're going to be talking about next. Oh, you're going to buy a boat? What kind of boat? How big a boat? Do you like boating? How much do boats run? And if they're getting $200,000 in proceeds and a boat costs 20000 bucks, well, gosh, that's only going to cover, what are you going to do with the 180000 that's left? And again, I'm not trying to pry. I'm just curious. I'm just a, a guy that's curious about what they're going to spend the money on. But if at any point I get the impression that they don't have a, a plan for this money, I'm going to ask the question. And the worst thing they can do is say no. But be clear, I am never, ever going to have the words come out of my mouth. Mr. Seller, would you consider seller financing this deal? You will never hear me say that to a seller. In fact, I don't even use seller financing when I'm talking to a seller. What I say is, if I paid you something up front, a reasonable amount up front, would you be willing to accept payments over time? For this? Would, it, would it help you even better? Would it help you to get payments for this over time? And then think about that and go, well, possibly. It might help me. It might help me from a tax standpoint. It might help me from a 
self-control standpoint? And if the answer is yes, now we're talking about how we could perhaps structure financing. But I'm never using the word financing, not saying owner financing, not saying seller financing. I don't say any kind of financing. I just say, would you be willing to accept some amount now and some payment over time and maybe in a balloon over, over some period of time. If you don't want to wait 30 years for this thing to amortize, maybe I'll pay you 10 years of payments at a thousand bucks a month. And then at the end of that, I'll pay you whatever the balance is in a lump sum. How's that sound? And if they go, yeah, it sounds pretty good. Then we, then we have a conversation point. Then we can take it from there and owner financing is created. Um, and that has tremendous value that we'll talk about in the next call. Uh, but that's, yeah, we'll get to subject in a minute. Uh, I'm, I talked about seller finance first. Uh, subject two is exactly the same thing, except what happens if they have financing on the property? So what happens if, if they don't own it free and clear? You know, they own a quarter million dollars worth of duplex. They're prepared to sell it uh, with financing, but there's debt on it. They owe $100,000 in debt. Can I still buy that with financing? And the answer is absolutely. I won't use the word financing. I'll say, what if I took over your payments for the 100000 and then paid you something for your remaining equity over time. Would that work for you? And they go, oh, maybe, that might work. Well, gosh, that's, that's seller financing. And for those of you who don't know what subject two is, I just realized I used a term I didn't define. Subject two is when you buy a property, uh, it is not a, 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 an assignment. I'm not, um, I'm, not, uh, taking, I'm not taking responsibility as far as a lender is concerned, I am simply making the payments on their behalf. So I get the deed, I leave the mortgage in your name. I own the property, I'm obligated, because if I don't make the payments, the lender's gonna take it away from me. I'm obligated to make this payment each month to the lender so that they're happy. Um, but I'm not going to um, put myself in your shoes with the lender. Uh, I'm simply going to make the payments on your behalf. Uh, and if I do that, it is said that I'm taking your mortgage over to subject two. That's what subject two is. So that's what you do when there's financing on the property. Um, so whether, there's, whether it's free and clear or there's financing, I can structure a, a, an arrangement that lets me pay something down and pay something over time. And if I pay something over time that is equal to the amount of equity that you've got, and nothing extra, then without saying the word, I have structured a 0% interest deal for myself. If I owe you $200,000 and we agree that I'm gonna pay you $1,000 for 200 months, let's say, then for 200 months, I'm gonna pay you $1,000 until paid in full. And if that, at the time that I pay that in full, I will have paid you $200,000 and not a penny of interest. The word interest wouldn't even have come up. I wouldn't even have said interest. And if the seller says, oh, that sounds like I can live with that, then you've just structured a 0% financing deal. So um, we'll talk, we'll get into detail about this um, on the next call. I, I wanna talk about how you structure these things, how you close these things, how you deal with tenants in the property, how you deal with things like estoppel, uh, which is the process by which you verify, if there are tenants that they're gonna be in there, how you verify that the information that you're getting is accurate. But, um, but the, the stuff that we talked about today lays the groundwork for all that. Uh, and if you don't get that, and truth be told, cash subject to and seller finance are true for any deal. They're not unique to tired landlords. So I will talk about it, but the truth is, this is not something that's specific to tired landlords, um, but it is uh, relevant because tired landlords, if they're tired enough, are willing to do these kinds of, of deals. And th those old timers who in many cases own their property free and clear actually make out better with financing than they do with getting a lump sum uh, of money that they're gonna get whacked tax wise for. So for them, it's better in, in most cases for them to get an income stream over time. Uh, plus, the income stream over time can outlive them. They can decide, you know what, I'm gonna sign, I'm gonna set this up so that this goes into uh, a trust that, uh, that you know, when I, when I pass on, my grandson gets this money. And so you start paying money to the grandson. You can help them with all sorts of creative structures that give them what they want while giving you what you want, which is payments over time with no interest.
if you can swing it. Um, but I don't want to get too far into that because I don't want to um, muddy the waters of this. So here's what I've got is my homework. I got to fix the, uh, the Jersey links because I don't know what uh, is causing them not to work because they worked just fine before. But I'll fix those uh, so that uh, those of you who want to dive into that can play around with it. My strong recommendation is that you play around with the data. Get comfortable, pick a city, pick a county, uh, a market that you care about and dive in and start playing around the data because that's how you learn how this stuff works. Um, and and you, you get to see the cases that uh, deserve to be uh, emulated and you, see, you get to see the cases where the landlord did everything wrong and lost a ton of money and you get to see exactly what they did wrong and why they did it wrong and how they did it wrong. Uh, it's all there in the, in, the, in the court records and it's in some cases, all the documents are there as well. So uh, there was no way that I could teach you that and teach you, walk you through doing that, but I've hopefully shown you how to access it for uh, a good number of, of uh, areas, some of which you're actually in and that, that you care about. Um, and I'll be adding to the list over time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, my request is that you capture them uh, and uh, email them to uh, Karina or myself. You're, 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 you're going to have better luck with Karina. And we'll capture those and compile them for the next call so that I can make sure that we answer them and so that everybody can, can hear them. I don't want to answer them individually um, because I want everybody to get the benefit of, of, uh, of hearing the answers. Um, that is pretty much uh, all I've got for today because I didn't want to overwhelm. Um, if, you, if no one's got any questions, I'm happy to, to stop. If you have questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. But I, I, at this point, you've got to take the next step because there's a lot of, I've covered a lot of data. And until you start to look at it yourself, you're not going to really be able to um, grasp all the stuff that I've shown you. I, I know I went through it very, very fast, uh, but you have all the tools. You have all the links. Once I fix the New Jersey stuff, you'll have all the, the working links and you have uh, example cases. You can play around with it. Uh, if it's consecutive, you can take what I gave you and add one to it and see the next case and the next case. Um, and, and there's thousands of cases. You, you won't run out of cases anytime soon. And a lot of these systems go back decades. So there's tons of stuff you can look at. Um, but um, this is, Oh, I, I did want to touch on this one because I, I sent a quick post about this, uh, the forbearance and the moratorium on eviction and foreclosure. Uh, and here's why that's relevant. Um, I, I agree with uh, Karina uh, that I think this is largely a political move to whatever your politics are. I think this is a political move to move what I think everybody knows is going to be a massive mess till after the election. I, I do agree with that. Uh, because we saw this in 2007 and 8. The reason why they're doing forbearance is because they didn't do forbearance in 2007 and 8. Lenders just foreclosed. Landlords just evicted. And there was this massive wave of foreclosures and evictions, and it killed the economy. Well, this is not, in my opinion, better. They're just delaying the pain because eventually they're going to have to foreclose and evict. I mean, foreclose, allow foreclosures and evictions to happen. So they're not going to fix this by the end of the year. It's not like COVID-19 is going to go away and everything's going to bounce back to normal. So when this does end, and it's going to end eventually, there's going to be a wave of foreclosures. There's going to be a wave of evictions. But what you should be thinking about now is who's, who filed in like March and is now, and, and for reasons that weren't COVID-19 related, but still can't get relief because the courts are closed. That person is screaming because their tenant's been living in there since March rent free. And now they got to go another six months like that. If they knew how that they could perhaps pay that tenant to move and sell that property and move on with their lives, they might be willing to get that thing gone. And if you could structure it so that you could get the tenant out for very little money and get control of that property, you could buy and put a good tenant in there. You could be making money on that thing even in the midst of all this forbearance stuff. So I'm not, I'm not packing up my stuff and saying, well, I'm going to wait until this is over. I'm just as busy now as I was, you know, last week. The fact that there, that there's a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures doesn't change the fact that there's still plenty of landlords out there hurting. In fact, they're hurting more now because they can't get paid. And a lot of them aren't getting any relief on their mortgage, but they still got to make, pay, still got to accept 
a forbearance will offer uh, a moratorium for their tenants. So they're squeezed between having to make payments out and not getting any money in. And if you can be the solution for them, you can pick up a lot of great properties right now. Plus, a lot of people who are thinking about getting out of the business, COVID-19 gave them a good reason to get the heck out right now. So they may not even have a situation where they had to file an eviction. They may have a perfectly paying tenant that's happily, you know, keeping their obligation. They just want to be done. They, if they weren't tired of, of 2020 before, they're done with it now. And they don't want to be a landlord anymore. And if you can find those people, you can potentially get a great deal. So I'm not saying that the only way to find these folks is to, to look for people who are owed money. You want to work your network and just talk to people who have property and see who's ready just to be, be done. Imagine being 84 years old and still having rentals and not being able to get out and, or sell it because all, of all this, this nonsense going on. Because think of it this way. How can you sell your property, your rental property, when the person who buys it can't evict anybody? How scary must that be for a buyer of property to buy a property knowing that if I, if I buy your property right now and I don't know what I'm doing, I can't evict the tenant. That's pretty scary. If you don't know, if you don't know how to pick tenants, if you don't know how to select and screen tenants, that's a scary thing. If you know how to, how to do that, those things and you can protect yourself with, oh, I don't know, a lease purchase, so you're getting a chunk of money up front, maybe you're not as scared about what happens if the tenant doesn't pay you because you get to keep their money. So I don't, I don't want to get too far into that, but I just want, I want to make the point that I am not less busy because of the moratorium. I'm at least as busy as I was before, if not more, because there's going to be way more landlords hurting now because they can't evict than before. So if they had allowed evictions, they would have left, they would have allowed the steam to bleed, to bleed off. Uh, they're, they're keeping it bottled up until 2021. And when it happens in 2021, it's going to explode. So now is the time to learn how this stuff works so that when 2021 hits, you're an experienced pro at this stuff. You're not learning it uh, while the opportunities are there. You already know it. All right. I've been talking. Hey, to a quick question. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, elaborate with a question uh, on that particular subject. Uh, you had put a, a message on uh, in the group. We were saying that um, um, reference to moratorium that the uh, it didn't count for people who own the property free and clear. Can you elaborate yeah. on that? Yeah. Thanks for reminding me of that one. That that was so. I wanted to make the point, and and if you read the article, the, the restrictions are being offered by the federal housing quasi-governmental agencies uh, that either uh, uh, underwrite or that typically underwrite um, loans. So your VA, your FHA, your Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Uh, and what they basically said is if you have a loan that's in any way subsidized or supported by the government, you've got to stay your evictions and your foreclosures. Great. If you, however, own your property free and clear, you can do whatever you want to. And if you could find one of these landlords that owns their properties free and clear, you can be evicting like a crazy person. Um, and, and there's no law that stops you. So yet another reason to be chasing after tired landlords who own their property free and clear, because they're, they're worth even more now because they're the few people who can evict without having to go through all this uh, CARES Act uh, disclosure. So, so yes, not only can you structure seller financing with these people, but once you get the, if you get the property under your possession, you don't have, you're not subject to those restrictions on, on, on uh, evictions and foreclosures. So it doesn't apply to you. So if, if I, I mean, I wish I, I mean, again, my goal, my, my, my goal in life is to put my hands on landlords in Cobb, and I know they exist, who are trying to get ready to retire, who have a bunch of properties, ideally free and clear. And if your entire portfolio is not free and clear, but you have some that are and some that aren't, how about I just buy the ones from you that are? And you can hold on to the ones that aren't for as long as you want to until, until the moratorium is over. But for the ones that are, how about I buy them from you right now? So if you can find free and clear owners, and Jenny, if you have access to uh, realist, you can see if there's any debt on the property. And as everybody that, that's seen my video knows, you can dive into the county records and pull up the liens and see if there's any liens on the property for free, if you have the expertise. So you can see if there's anything on there. And if there's nothing on there and they own it in their own personal name, then 
you're golden. If you, 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 you ask them and you, oh, of course, you'll have an attorney do an actual title search to make sure you didn't miss anything. But if you can confirm that they own it free and clear, and typically if, they, if the landlord says that they do, they do. There's no reason for them not to tell the truth because they know you're going to do a title search and verify it. So they're not going to hide it. But if they own it free and clear, then you should be doing whatever you have to do to get that deal. Because that deal right now is priceless because they are the only people on the planet, or at least in the United States, that can evict without any restriction. Now, better that you not have to evict in the first place. So I'm not saying that evicting is great, but if you had to evict, it's nice to know that you could if you, if you needed to. Um, and if you have a federally uh, endorsed mortgage, then even if you need to, you can't do it until the end of the year. And who knows if they're not gonna extend it at the end of the year, uh, because they're kicking the can down the road and it's, it's going to, it's going to hurt just as much in January, 2021, as it does now, as it would now. It's just that now it's, it's impacting, it's going to impact the election. So I get that, that they're going to try to delay that. But the bottom line is it's going to happen. Um, and when it does happen, A, you're going to want to be trained to take advantage of the opportunity to help the people who need relief. But in the meantime, yes, Brunel, you should definitely be looking for landlords who own their property free and clear because those are the only people out there who can evict their tenants without any restriction. And that right now is like platinum embedded with diamonds covered in gold. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Um, Thank you very much. Sure. I mean, um, I, oh, I will say this cause I, I, it's probably worth saying, uh, there's an old joke. Um, guy comes across another guy who's uh, standing underneath a street lamp, looking around, and the guy says, "What are you doing?" He says, "I'm looking for my watch." And so um, the guy says, "Okay, I'll help you." So they start looking for around for the watch. And the guy says, "Oh, by the way, where'd you? Roughly speaking, where, where'd you lose it?" And the guy says, "Well, I lost it way over there." The guy says, "Well, why the heck are you looking over here?" The guy says, "Well, because the light's better over here." you want to consider going where it's easy to get the, might consider going where it's easy to get the data. So I don't have an interest right now in, um, I don't have a specific interest in DeKalb. I have nothing against DeKalb, but if DeKalb data is easy to get, then guess what? I may decide, and by easy, I mean to have a system that's easy to, to scrape. If it's easy to scrape, I may become a DeKalb person just so I can find those deals because I don't have to keep every deal that I find. I could find DeKalb deals and wholesale them to Jenny, that they're good enough deals and they qualify and they meet her needs. So you don't have to, do, and this is, this is uh, Lynn asked me if, if the information I was gonna teach here was gonna be relevant for out of state investors and, and it is, and here's why. Because if you don't care where the deal is, if you just care about your ability to structure a great deal and sell somebody who wants to buy it, then it doesn't matter where you physically are. If you can get this data from a market that is for which that data is valuable to somebody else, that someone's buying in that market and you can structure these deals, even if you just wholesaled them, you could make a nice living for yourself, never touching the deal, never seeing the deal. I mean, I'm in, I'm in normally in Clovis, New Mexico and I'm doing wholesale deals in Atlanta and I'm never seeing the deal, never touching it, never, doing anything directly with the deal. Everything is done by people on the ground. Um, most of whom who don't work directly for home pride properties. They're contractors that I pay, but if I'm making $10,000 in the deal, am I prepared to pay a hundred bucks for somebody to go put a lock, not maybe a hundred bucks, 50 bucks, for somebody to put a lock box on the door. Yeah, probably. So I don't care about seeing the property with my own eyes. As long as someone sees it with their eyes, that's good enough for me. And so you may decide to invest in markets, just based on where the data is easy to get. Um, that's why I provided you a column in the uh, cheat sheet for provider, uh, because there's a provider uh, called uh, Tyler slash Odyssey that offers a lot of systems for courts around the country. And once you've seen their system, you kind of know how that thing works and you can you know, scrape one, you scrape them all. If you, if you could get your scraper to scrape all the systems that kind of look the same, and then get that data and mine that data and then try to do deals with that data, you could wholesale all that stuff and never ever own a property in a market that you don't care about, but wholesale the deals. And if you do that, please call me because I'd love, I'd love to sell those deals to some of my investors. But, but yes, 
the, the opportunity here is not just in the markets that you care about, it's in the markets that have systems that can be exploited to extract this information and then reach out to the uh, landlords. Because the good news is that a landlord is a landlord is a landlord. The, the, the challenges of a landlord in, the laws are different, but the challenges of a landlord in New York are very, very similar to the challenges of a landlord in Atlanta. The, the tenants are, for the most part, brain dead aliens from another planet, no matter where you are. So understanding how landlords interact with tenants means you need to know the laws for that, that state, but you may decide, you know what, I'm gonna, I live in Texas, but I'm gonna work in New Jersey, or I live in New Jersey, but I'm gonna work Texas. Or in my case, I live in Clovis, I'm gonna work Texas and New Jersey and Cincinnati and uh, Las Vegas, if I can get some data on them. Any market that I can find some, some, some uh, people to talk to, because landlords will talk to landlords from anywhere. They don't care. They're not gonna say, well, what, what state were you a landlord in? If you're a landlord, you're a landlord. Or, and if you have experience talking to landlords, any landlord will listen to what you have to say. At least for, a, you, you buy yourself at least a minute. If you have something valuable to say, you get another minute. And you, as you keep saying more valuable stuff, you keep putting coins into that machine, they keep listening to what you have to say. And then at some point they go, okay, this guy's for real. Let me see if I can do a deal. Um, but what you don't want to do is come to them with the standard real estate investor. If I buy your house fast and pay all cash, how quickly, how, how cheaply can I buy your house? That doesn't work for these guys. These guys are, um, either experienced enough to know better or inexperienced enough that's going to scare them off. You need to treat them like squirrels in a park, feeding them little nuggets of information slowly and carefully until they start to realize, oh, this guy's okay. I can trust this person. They can help me. Uh, and that's how I do my deals. And uh, that's how I recommend people do their deals. So uh, at this point, I have been talking for nearly two and a half hours. So I need to stop talking. Uh, I appreciate you all being here. Um, you are my guinea pig, so I would value your feedback. Uh, I know that I've, I've you know, there's, there's pl plenty of things I could be doing better. I know it's a lot of content, uh, but if you have some helpful suggestions, don't hurt my feelings, but if you have some helpful suggestions, I'm happy to absorb them. Um, and um, uh, my goal with this, as with pretty much all my training, is to make sure that you guys can do these deals because my, my long-term big picture goal is Jenny comes to me and says, hey, I got a deal in the cab and I wanna wholesale it, can we JV on it? Or Vernell comes and says, hey, I got a deal in New Jersey that I, I wanna take down with some help, can we joint venture on it? Or Lynn, you find something that you can do, deal with and I know you've got Marlo, so you probably don't need me, but if there's a way that I can do deals with you, that to me is the value. The, the training is just so that, so that we're all on the same page about what we're looking for. But I really want the value to be doing deals because that's where the money is. The, you know, the course is great, but I wanna do deals with people in Cobb County that are tired landlords. That's where the money is. So I want you to do the same thing. So with that, I'm going to let, let my voice get some rest and try to get some rest myself. Thank you all for being on the call. I hope you found this to be valuable and not overwhelming. Um, you, most of you do have, I think all of you have scheduled or have yet to schedule or have yet to, to hold your your one-on-one -on -one call. So anything that you didn't get or that you wanted to talk privately about, uh, you're welcome to share it for that. Um, but if there's anything about the course that you don't understand, please do share it so that I can make sure that everybody uh, hears the question and, me, and the answer so that we can make sure that we're all getting better and helping each other get smarter. Uh, I, I do this because I want a community of investors that can get deals done. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a pack animal. I want to see us take down uh, a big water buffalo by, or an elephant by, by hitting it from five different angles and taking it down and, and um, being successful. So for me, this, it's an honor to be able to, uh, to explain to you how I've done this and that you see some value in it. So thank you for your attention and your uh, attendance. And uh, with that, I'm going to unless someone has any questions, I'm going to call it a day and let Karina um, close this down. Cool. Uh, Karina, I think you, oh, I have to give you back. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing yeah. now. I can end it. I'm good. Okay, cool. All right, folks. Uh, the next call is Sunday. Uh, you've got the, I think you've already got it scheduled in your calendars. So we'll pick up where we left off and cover the, uh, the tail end of this.
in my opinion, the, the money part. Um, but um, I look forward to that. And um, you guys have a great evening.